Um, just a reminder, the meeting is being webcast. And so can I remind everyone to wait for the microphone and speak into the microphone to make sure you are heard. If you don't do so, you will not be picked up by the uh, webcast. Uh, agenda item 11 contains an exempt appendix, which has commercially sensitive information. Uh, so any discussion on the content of this appendix will need to be held in exempt session. And cabinet members have been given access to this appendix. Uh, um, agenda item two, public forum. And this is a reminder as usual that statements and questions will be taken at the time of the uh, relevant agenda item, at the time it's being discussed. And I will reply to the questions or ask the relevant cabinet member to supply an answer to that, uh, to those questions. Now, given the amount of public forum uh, at some items, I, uh, we will be timing uh, with our monitoring officer the contributions to make sure we get through uh, you know, as many statements and, and questions as possible. Uh, apologies for absence. So, yeah, Tom. Yeah, so we have one cabinet member who's still on a call upstairs and will be Dan Sue, so we have no absences for the meeting as a whole. Agenda item four, decorations of interest. Any cabinet members have any decorations of interest? Yeah, I, I have um, a couple, yeah. So um, on the Bristol Beacon paper, I'm the council appointed um, trustee on the Bristol Music Trust board, so I will step out. It's a non-pecuniary interest, but it's one that um, I should declare. And secondly, I have, I'm have i a trustee of a, a range of organisations, actually, that have applied to the cultural investment um, pot, so I will also step out of the room for that one. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Um, agenda item five, matters referred for consideration by scrutiny or full council. Nothing uh, has been referred by scrutiny or full council today. Agenda item six, reports from scrutiny commissions. Uh, so a statement coming from resources scrutiny on their finance task group is being presented, I understand, by Councillor Jeff Gollop, but I don't, not here. Okay. Okay, so we'll just have to take that report in um, after the meeting. On to agenda item seven, uh, Chair's Business. Um, I've got three areas I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about today. First is to welcome Abby uh, Gabago, who's now joined us, fantastically so, as our new Exec Director for Children and Young People, working closely uh, with Asha. Um, it's... It's a, it's a fantastic appointment for Bristol as a whole, for children and young people in Bristol uh, in particular. It's already uh, has, has a fantastic reputation. It's come down from uh, London boroughs, where a number of leaders were trying to recruit her. So for her to choose to come to Bristol, um, I think is a real, is, I will genuinely say it's a blessing uh, for us um, and brings really needed expertise and, and drive and leadership to you know, our team. We're working very closely with Stephen as our our chief exec. Um, also, this is the last cabinet before the Six Nations uh, kicks off. So we do want to say uh, good luck and all the best to two of our Bristol standard bearers, Bristol Props, Ellis Genge and Kyle Sinclair. And uh, worth just raising that Ellis um, accepted the position as one of our Bristol international ambassadors. And we've already started talking to Ellis and planning uh, things that he will do to represent Bristol on the world stage, including the anniversary of our, our link with um, Georgia. Uh, and uh, they've obviously got a big rugby tradition in Georgia as well. So he's going to be doing some stuff to help us with our international relations uh, in the summer and, and more than that also. And just on to the, the size of today's... Oh, well, I would add, I guess, another uh, uh, story now. We are raising money, if I can just steal the platform... Uh, running, I'll be running the London Marathon for North Bristol Trust Charity. Um, I was asked to do it. I said yes in a hurry, regretted it in a month after, but my miles are increasing, so I think I might be able to make it around, even on my knees by the end. Um, and on today's uh, you know, agenda, it is a big agenda. We're covering a whole range of, of areas that are of critical challenge to us in the current financial context. Um, we have a number of items on adult social care. Um, it will be covering um, autism. I'll be looking at our children's homes 
Uh, we have a paper coming through on the youth zone, uh, which is obviously hugely important as well with making sure that we've got resources and investment going to the lives of young people, particularly some of the most marginalised young people uh, in the city and by extension the country with where the, some of those areas are. Uh, we've got updates on um, energy projects and obviously we have our budget coming through, uh, which, uh, it is, which obviously is the backdrop of challenge to local government at the moment. So we are going to manage time. Um, we've asked for confirmation of attendance today. Um, if you did confirm, we've put your name to the top of the list for statements and questions, and we'll try and take your questions uh, in the item. If we are running out of time for questions, what we will try and do is, even if we don't have time to give the answers, we'll give you the chance to stand up and ask your questions so you get the floor, and then we'll send written uh, responses afterwards. All right, so let's just, just juggle the um, agenda a little bit. Uh, Jeff, I've seen you've just come in. We moved on. So why don't we go back to give you a chance to, um, uh, for your, um, uh, your report to, to Cabinet. Jane. Thank you, Marvin. Yeah, apologies for lateness. I was in the queue waiting to come through and join the public gallery, so uh, my apologies. Uh, what I just really wanted to do is just make some comments on the budget papers. Um, but, but first of all, I just wanted to put on record, and I'm pleased to do it in front of all of Cabinet, that uh, the, the, the budget task group has had the most remarkable contribution from finance officers over what has been an incredibly difficult period. And I know that's come with Craig's blessing as well. Uh, but we've really appreciated the level of engagement and openness that's taken place and I am very happy to put on record that I think it's an exceptional example of how scrutiny should work. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that in what uh, all members of the task group recognise has been an incredibly difficult year for Cabinet and for finance officers. So I want to preface my comments with that. And we have comments to make. These are cross-party comments. They're not meant to be political. Uh, simply areas that give us concern. Um, and I really wanted to just share those because I think it's important that we open up the public debate on these issues at this point. Um, Scrutiny are holding two more meetings next week to go through the final budget proposals in detail and a more detailed report will follow. But what we've got now are some headline figures. The first point, and I say not political because I think officers and Cabinet share the concerns relates to the dedicated schools grant, where the potential deficit that is growing from the special needs block is coming to a level where it is certainly giving members a great deal of cause for concern. And it looks very unhealthy in terms of the ongoing balance sheet. And we do have a concern about that. And we think that the action plan needs to be brought forward and we need to see a direction of travel where that risk and that liability is diminishing rather than continuing to grow at some £20 million a year. So that was one issue. Um, secondly, we do have concerns about the savings proposals. We have concerns because we recognise after many years of savings there are very limited amounts available by which further savings can be made and we do question whether those savings can be achieved without jeopardizing service levels so we want some assurances in that respect uh, but we understand the challenges that officers are trying to deal with um, we do feel that all savings proposals need to have enough information for members to fully understand them and we are struggling with some aspects of that. We recognise this has been pulled together under pressure, but we will be raising questions next week in the hope that we can get that clarified. We've raised previously that we feel Invest to Save is an area that is still not being looked at as much as it could be uh, as a way of mitigating some of the excessive pressures on some of the issues such as homelessness and adult care and we would like that to be considered 
uh, in more detail. Um, we will be exploring these points in detail at our scrutiny sessions next week, and we will make further comments, but I just conclude by repeating my thanks to the finance officers for a fantastic job, extremely well done, under uh, uh, what is not the most encouraging of circumstances for them to be reporting in. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Jeff. I mean, I'll just offer a bit to Craig if you wanted to say something, but if I just start, I'd also, I mean, I don't need to thank you because you have a direct relationship with them yourselves, but it is important to thank the officers. I think there have been times when we've been concerned about staff well-being, uh, when you get getting emails at three in the morning from people, you know, burning midnight oil to get through the, the financial process, which comes on us like a, you know, a tidal wave moving at X hundred mile an hour. I mean, it's, it's been a huge financial uh, uh, challenge and, and they have worked incredibly hard uh, with Cabinet and I'm glad to hear that they've worked with um, uh, councillors uh, of all parties. Uh, the DSG, we share that challenge. I mean, there's, no, there's no two ways about it. The numbers speak for themselves and it is a, it is a challenge for us. Uh, and it's something we are concerned about and um, are, are looking to navigate. And one of the top challenges we bring to, to Abby, now she's coming to, to post as well. Um, the savings proposals, um, you know, a, a, again, we'd welcome the scrutiny of that because we do need to keep testing them. It's something that we've been through as a process, uh, you know, as a cabinet. Um, and Stephen has been doing a whole, you know, series of whole work with Kevin, making make, pressing back on some of the proposals that are being forward, brought forward to make sure uh, uh, they're real. So we we would uh, welcome that. Um, I, I would say one of the the points I made to um, Andy Haldane who's the chief exec of um, one of the authors of Leveling Up, and he didn't need it made, but we were in a discussion, was there is no pain-free way of dealing with our finances now. There is no way of getting to a budget that we're legally required to present that doesn't impact on what we do in a city. That, so um, uh, there is no more fat to cut, and local authorities of all colours in all parts of the country are making this point uh, to, to central government. And it's one of, the, one of the reasons we were, even though we were happy to get 14 and a half million pound, we're also incredibly frustrated by the leveling up process. Uh, this kind of chuck a bunch of money in the middle of the table and telling local authorities to fight for it is no way to run, no way, it's not a plan, it's not a strategy. And again, those people that are not Westminster Whitehall based have been pointing this out, again, from all political backgrounds. The investor save, I welcome that too. It is something we want to do. But again, one of the points we've made up in London with the LGA is it costs money. By definition, you are front-loading money you don't necessarily have. Uh, and so again, one of the kind of hidden costs of the financial situation we find ourselves in is that sometimes we don't have the space, the capacity, and that's not just investing in projects, is having the experts available upstream to think about organizational restructure. You don't have access to that to take, adv take advantage of the opportunities that may be presenting themselves. This is another case we're making through the LGA to government that we do need to reinvent the way local government works. We can't have a 2002 version of local government in a 20 2022 context on 2022 money. It's just not possible. Um, so, but that reinvention takes time and resource, and that's not readily available as we try to deal with the other crises that are landing on us uh, right now as well. But I think, you know, thank you for your contribution. Ongoing scrutiny of that is going to be massively important for, for all of us. And that's at the local level, but also the world, the LGA work as well on behalf, on our behalf. Sorry, Craig, I went on, but did you have anything to contribute? Well, uh, no, I, I suppose I'd just comment that, um, yeah, th thanks for your comments, Jeff. We have tried to, um, you know, for officers to bring you information as soon as we have it, literally sometimes the same day as, as we're getting it in Cabinet, um, which I think is probably unusual for <laughs> how things work in the Council, but probably, you know, some of the most important areas. And um, obviously that puts extra pressure on the finance team. We're already, you know, well, I know that they worked all day and night over weekends to get to get this process through. So to, to take the time that they needed to, to share that with you and talk you through it, I think is admirable on their part. And I'd probably just, like you have, commend them for it. Thank you. We'll feed that back to them as well. We'll give some personal thanks, and I'm sure you can as well. So let's go on to end agenda item eight, which is budget report and treasury management strategy. Um, I'm going to introduce this and then um, hand over to Craig. Uh, so it has been a huge challenge for us to work through the process uh, in, the in the context of both the cost of living 
crisis, which means that we have to step up the level of support we provide to the city, but also a cost of operating crisis, which has meant that providing that support actually costs us, and not just us, but our city partners uh, more. Uh, but I will say we are proud, as, as challenging it's been, to present a balanced budget uh, for a seventh year. Um, just look at the context in which we've had to work over the years. It's been challenging, those seven uh, budgets. Uh, 12 years of, of austerity going on 13. We've had a global pandemic. Uh, we've had three general elections, five, five prime ministers, eight secretaries of state for local government, overseeing a department that's had three different names. So it's not necessarily been easy to find the advocates to, ad, you know, to speak up for the importance of local government around that, that cabinet table. Uh, I won't say any more about the current, but at least we have someone, I think, I, while I disagree with the politics, we, we hope we've got someone who will do some thinking, who will have some heft in around that cabinet table now in, in Gove, but let's see uh, what happens. You know, look, it, it, in that context, all that instability, the lack of finance, we have uh, maintained a focus on delivery, um, hence the houses that we've been built, for example. Um, and we've combined our ambition for Bristol, which we've been very un unapologetic about. So, for example, on Channel 4, for bringing Channel 4 for Bristol and getting Temple Mees done, uh, to uh, we've combined that ambition with build a commitment to building an inclusive economy that includes a commitment to getting every child off to the best possible start in life in the spirit of Michael Marmot's uh, 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 report um, and protecting the most vulnerable people um, in the city. And that's not easy but it's why our priorities that we've had continue to be reflected um, in this budget. House building, feeding children, including the uh, free school meals outside term time uh, program, the 100% council tax reduction scheme, our children's centres, the investment we're gonna hear about today in the youth zones, maintenance of the local crisis uh, prevention fund, uh, protecting libraries, and, and also, which is a real point of pride for us, we now have 86, I believe it is, welcoming spaces around the city that we started setting up last spring ahead of heat uh, energy bills going up so that people could have somewhere to go and be warm um, and somewhere to go and get something to eat and get contact with services so that 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 spine of commitment uh, to, to being an inclusive city is run through what we do and you'll see it in our budget um, Helen knows because it so much falls on her shoulders adult social care remains a major challenge for us children's you know as well um, and we, we will be doing a major piece of work, uh, well, we have been, but we're really uh, going to be doing some work with the, with the NHS uh, on how we really get our hands around the, the system of adult social care um, and NHS services uh, to look at that whole system and how we make sure it works uh, more efficiently, but more effectively, more importantly, for, for the, the people of this part of the world. Craig, let me hand over to you now to, to take this report forward. Yeah, thanks, Marvin. Um, so on, I mean, on top of the things you've mentioned, nearly 70% of our budget now goes on social care and education in the city. The national crisis in the health and social care system continues to threaten and squeeze everything else the council does. And so budgets for things that citizens quite rightly expect the council to provide get smaller and smaller while we continue to maintain the failures of nat national government to grasp the nettle on these um, era-defining problems, really. This budget contains further reductions in our back office capacity, something that never generates a placard or a protest, but does contribute to the council struggling to deliver on the functions that support the rest of the council to deliver, as well as supporting local businesses and residents to, to deliver themselves. Beyond balancing the many complicated and competing priorities and protecting the most vulnerable, as, as Marvin has uh, gone through, um, and through what must have been the most difficult time in local government for the past 80 years, we do also remain very ambitious for the future of the city. The capital programme continues to invest in that future, beyond the initial £450 million rising to a potential £1 billion investment intended to help decarbonise the city through City Leap programme. We also have a huge range of projects and programmes that support the city into the future. These include nearly £60 million for schools and SEM provision, £4 million COVID recovery funding going to community organisations, money to replace the fleet and move toward a carbon neutral future, £39 million for the Temple Square and Temple Gate redevelopment, £14 million for the regeneration of Bedminster Green, £20 million for flood defences, £60 million in highways, bridges and transport infrastructure improvements, £32 million in delivering new homes for Bristol, and that's outside the huge investment in council housing coming through the housing revenue account, which we'll hear about later. There's £8 million for sports provision, and finally money to redevelop the Bristol Beacon, which we'll hear about later, bringing an estimated £50 million GVA to the city and supporting the local economy and vibrant nightlife in the city. A huge amount is happening. It's a difficult time, but we continue to protect the most vulnerable and continue to be ambitious for the city, despite the incredibly challenging times in which we live. 
there were some errors in the um, original paper. Uh, this comes back to the point we were making about um, finance officers being worked uh, incredibly difficult late nights to, to get these papers through. So a, a supplementary paper has been provided with the corrections. In terms of what we're recommending to full council today, we're recommending the um, level of council tax increases to 4.99%, which includes the 2% precept to support adult social care, noting the precepts of the Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset and the Fire Authority. Um, we also recommend to council that the um, council's general fund net revenue budget for the year 23-24 is 483.5 million. Um, uh, that's probably all I really need to say now, so I'll hand back to you, Mara. Okay. Thanks, Craig. And, and so any, we've, we've a range of topics cov co covering a range of cabinet portfolios. I'll answer some, I'll start some, and other cabinet members will come in if it's, they're going to indicate to me if they want to, to pick up uh, the question. Uh, so we've had 14 public forum uh, statements and we've had 20 public forum questions. And Tim is going to help me uh, keep track of this. For the, um, the statements, you get one minute. I will be strict because of time, okay? Let me just put my stopwatch on. So the first we have is Live Fortune. So one minute, thank you very much. Thank you for deciding to keep Bristol Central Library in its well-established location. It's the right decision. It has to be said that against a backdrop of devastating Tory austerity, this Labour Council, against all odds, has managed to keep almost all of Bristol's libraries open, which I think is something to celebrate when we consider that other councils in the country on the verge of bankruptcy have had to close libraries. Now, I have heard from a few people that um, you had no intention of actually relocating Central Library, and that this was some kind of um, stunt, if you like, to kind of deflect from things like the Bristol Beacon being massively over budget and other unpopular things happening in the city. I really hope, Marvin, that those people are wrong, because I've come here on two occasions now to um, campaign against this. Just 10 seconds. It's taken a real toll on me and my well-being and my mental health. So if those people are right in what they're saying, then that really is not OK. Martin. OK. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, the next uh, public statement is from uh, Estella Tinknell. Estella. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Cabinet. Um, I'm here on behalf of Bristol History Commission. As members of the Bristol History Commission, established by Mayor Rees, we've been pleased to have contributed to the process whereby Bristol has begun to acknowledge and address the long-standing legacies of the transatlantic traffic and enslaved Africans, and to develop a new narrative about the city. Our 2021 report, The Colston Statue, What Next?, was based on the responses of nearly 14,000 citizens of Bristol to the so-called Colston toppling in June 2020, and its recommendations have shaped ambitious plans for the exhibition of the statue and associated materials in Bristol's museums. We are therefore very concerned that these plans, which are Arts Council funded, may be delayed or postponed due to proposed cuts to the culture team budget. We are also concerned that the culture team does not seem to have currently senior managers who are best placed to make decisions about the statue and indeed about the important work that's being done Just to change ten. the way Bristol's history will that's be represented. It. We urge the Mayor and Cabinet to rethink proposals to further cuts to the culture budget and would like to emphasise that delays to the plans for the exhibition of the statue will mean that the Mayor's and the City's constructive response to the toppling may be threatened by future events events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are now on to... Let me just actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through people who perhaps didn't respond, but may be here. So let me just have a quick run through uh, names. Uh, Joanna Booth. I know Dave Wedgwell's here. I saw you, Dave. Can we get a microphone to Dave, please? Um, Dave Rager on behalf of uh, South West Transport Network and the user group. Um, our concerns really is the transport levy that we need to passport to the West England Milk and Bike Authority. There hasn't really been enough this year for more three unitaries to maintain the bus network. 
So we're in a very difficult position with a lot of bus service cuts in South Bristol and East Bristol. Now, there may be a way forward, but it'll depend on the mayor and the leaders of the other three unitaries agreeing to look at how we spend the bus service improvement plan money. There are some routes that are new routes that haven't yet been let, and we've still got money in the bank to try and use some of that money. So my suggestion would be very clear to make sure that we cover what buses we can with the bus service improvement plan uh, money where we can because the Westlink transport services um, are obviously very small. Uh, Just 10 seconds, okay, Dave. Nine or uh, 16 or maybe 30 seater vehicles. And I am concerned about South Bristol, people getting to hospital and to schools. And also just make a point. Okay. Uh, final point is to say the ferries in Bristol Harbour are not a commercial project. They're a cooperative and we just want to make sure we can continue to run them. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Dave. Um, so I'm just going to run through other people on the list that hadn't confirmed, but maybe here. Bristol Disabilities Equalities Forum. Bristol Parts Forum. Okay, just one minute. All right, thank you. Um, just here to say thank you to everybody who responded to the consultation on the budget to show their support for parks. And then thank you very much, Marvin and the Cabinet, for responding to that consultation and to withdrawing the proposal that was to cut parks. Um, thank you especially to Ellie King for several conversations with Parks Forum during that time. And we look forward to cons some constructive uh, conversations in the future as part of a big parks conversation to make sure that we're not in the same position again next year. So thank you very much. Thanks very much uh, for that. Um, uh, Jeff Sutton. Jen Smith. Okay, those are all the public forum statements. Okay, so let's move on now to public questions. Um, and the first is Liv Fortune. Thank you very much, Marvin. So, um, as I said in my question, on two occasions, the two occasions that I've been campaigning against plans to relocate Central Library, on both occasions, you said that there had been real strength of feeling from the people of Bristol. Um, who made it extremely clear that um, you know, we're not open to Bristol Central Library being relocated. So rather than continuing to use it as a kind of football, um, will you today pledge to just accept that we are not open to Bristol Central Library being re relocated and to save you know, money, energy, distress for people like myself? I think I'm the only person who's actually come here to talk about this subject. Um, okay. Will you pledge today to just accept that we are not open to it being relocated and to not do this in future? Okay. Thanks, Liv. Um, and I'm sorry to hear about the impact it's had on you personally. I can guarantee you it's had a similar... You know, all Cabinet members here and loads of officers have gone through a very difficult time as well. So it's had an impact on, you know, politicians and... Uh, council workers so it's across the board that impact um, we we posed a question that we need to explore uh, in in face of an 80 million potential gap it, nothing was off the table we had to do it that's part of being a responsible um, cabinet we had to do that we had to look at that and it was only right that we did that um, so whilst it's off the table for this year I can't promise what future administrations will do because these potential risks will come back our way again, and I can't guarantee what their decisions will be. But I think it's only right to look at it and explore it, because if we want to talk about what a modern um, library service should look like, I think it should be one that's fully accessible. Central Library isn't. I think we need to talk about um, how a building costs and, and how much can we cope with that. You're going to talk about Bristol Beacon soon. This, Central Library is, is going to have huge building costs that we need to uh, deal with. Is it right that the whole service and the council uh, becomes responsible for that, for, that def for that problem that's going to escalate whilst we try and fix it up? It's also, it's we need to, to generate income so we have a sustainable service. Central Library can't do that. It's continually saying no to events because of its grade li listed building status, which means it can't be used for everything because we can't move around the furniture how they want. So it's limited. And it's not necessarily reflective of what a modern library service should be. Not to mention the footfall that we get. It's in a quite um, 
you know, the people that come around here, they've got certain transport links that we don't have in other areas of the city. Broadmead has uh, buses that go there that we don't have around here from all parts of the city. So you've only got certain areas that are, that are accessing the library and it's quite an exclusive shopping area. So it attracts a certain cohort of people. I'm quite interested in the other areas that, that such as Broadmead that address, um, you know, get a whole range of people from all over the city, from all demographics. And I really want a diverse and inclusive library. So there's, there's lots of questions I think need to be looked at and explored, and I think we need to be able to pose these questions without there being a knee-jerk reaction. And we need to have the conversation, and we need to have it responsibly and look at the service as a whole, because I didn't get one email about the other 26 libraries. It was only about Central Library. And what about the other 26? You know, it, it's a service. It isn't a building. It's a service. Do you have a, a supplementary? Yeah, I mean, you, you've made some good points you know I agree with a lot of what you're saying my concern about it was is in my perception it was I was concerned that the cathedral school were going to do what they did back in 2012 and sort of claim the rest of that but it is a public building that was my concern but I do agree with a lot of what you're saying um, as for your comment about um, you know sorry Liv, can I just pressure, ask you to ask the um, question because we've got a lot to get through politicians are paid and you've got advisors that you can turn to for support I you know I don't get paid I've got no agenda I just come here because I care about certain things um, my supplementary question what was I going to ask? <laughs> I've forgotten what I was going to ask now. Um, so, yes, I'll just stop. But thank you for your response. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, our next, the, no one else has, in, uh, has said that they are here that was going to ask a question. So, I'm just going to run through the list very quickly. Have I got time to? Yep, okay. Um, public question Dave Redwell. Uh, my question really is about the budget head, about um, reductions in transport staff and the transport uh, team. Um, the mayor of the west of England uh, is very short of staff and has about a billion pounds to spend on transport infrastructure. Um, the one thing he doesn't have is a lot of staff to spend on them. I just want to know what progress is happening to transfer staff between Bristol City Council and the west of England mayoral and bike authority as soon as possible, including discussions, I must say, with the unions. Yeah, well, well, we actually actually found the combined authorities had a 50% increase in staff headcount, uh, Dave. Um, uh, recently, you'll, you'll see in the budget and you'll be at the meeting on Friday. So it is building as a, a, layer, a, a, you know, a, a place of governance. Um, and we are continuing to work. We've had really good discussions uh, with the combined authority to talk about the transfer of those transport functions uh, and, and staff to the combined authority. You've been a real advocate as well of making sure that the, the resources are in the right place for that level of strategic planning that has to be about Bristol. And we as a, a city council retain the right powers to say yes or no on what happens in our city. But our plans for transport have to be, uh, have to be uh, kind of driven at the regional level. That's, that's one of the reasons we, we have it and one of the reasons we win uh, re resources for it. Um, so, you know, like I said, I, I think it, you'll have a chance to speak into this on Friday again at the next uh, Combined Authority. But thank you. The moral question is, I am, we've got a lot of skills in this building. Uh, I've worked with all those people. Um, I'd rather see those people transferred than us bringing in lots of outside consultants that don't know much, much about Bristol and just borrow our money and deliver or don't deliver for the city. So right. it's quite important. I think we do retain as many of the staff as possible rather than just bring lots of consultants, is it? Now that sounded like you snuck a statement in there rather than a question, but but you are Dave Redwell, so we, yeah, it's question, okay. <laughs> well, I wasn't invited. <laughs> my, sorry, my, my additional question was really about can we just make sure we don't use, we use our own staff and don't use yeah. as many consultants? That's my point. That's that's the aim. Um, but but again, it, I mean, one of the points that Craig made was one of the invisible costs of the financial challenges we've been for been through. No one comes outside City Hall and protests for planners, transport experts, lawyers and accountants. And yet those are the people that keep the, keep the cogs of the city moving for housing delivery, affordability, getting these projects market ready, being able to do the deals to get stuff across the line. And so actually there's a little bit of an imbalance in the, the nature of our public debate um, actually as to, as to the, the function of local government. But when we don't have those people in house because we have lost them through the financial challenges, we end up needing to go out and get consultants. Uh, because we haven't been able to retain them on the payroll, we haven't been able to match the, the salaries in the private sector. That's one of the hard 
uh, and horrible realities that we've uh, we faced as, uh, as local authorities, but we will do our best to make sure we have the in-house in expertise. Um, our next uh, question, did you, did you have a second question, Dave? Yeah, so sorry, I've seen it now, I've got it in front of me. Um, yeah, so I suppose the, the question I want to ask really, it is an important question, is what progress is being made on Metro West Railway? Thank you for the prod. Um, I think there is an issue there about um, the Henbury line and the arena, and um, I am becoming very concerned, I think Don's heard this before, about the lack of progress on the planning permission at Filton Station North and Henbury. Um, if we're to get that line open and to open the arena on time, we really need to make progress. And I just want to ask what progress is really being made to push this to the top of the agenda at Wecker and Network Rail. Yeah, we, we, we agree with that. We, we share that concern in this, uh, it, you know, it's a push we've always been making. We've wanted a, you know, a stronger role for, for YTL as well and uh, concerns about relying on Network Rail and all sorts. So, um, you know, we share that. But the Metro West 2, if you're going about the wider Metro West 2 uh, project, you know, it's being led by the combined authority. Uh, working, obviously, as I said, closely with Network Rail. Um, and for us, there's a particular interest as well in delivering those stations, the Henbury, uh, the Ashley Down, and that filter north, the, the Whitetail Arena uh, station, uh, you know, as well. Um, so um, a paper that sets out the position um, that we are in, the current status, will be taken to the Combined Authority Joint Committee on Friday. So, again, you'll have a chance to you know, kind of get your hands around that. Do you have a supplementary, Dick? I, mean, you know, I wonder if there could be some follow-up direct discussions between Bristol City Council and South Gloucestershire County Council regarding the hold-ups on the planning permissions, particularly at Filton and Henbury. That is really causing us concern. Network Rail say there's a planning permission issue at those two stations. Can we just see if we can get some progress? They, those conversations are happening regularly. Myself and Toby, uh, Dave, his chief exec, and Stephen, our, our chief exec, we meet every month, uh, once a month. And we plan through some of the cross-border issues, the park and ride on the M32, for example, what's happening around the arena. Um, the, the, you know, so, so it is a regular point at which we try to work together irrespective of what's happening around us. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think we're moving on to question eight from Mersh Clark. No. Okay, I'm just going to run through this list here, All right? Philippa Hume, uh, Philippa, hey. Hi, yes. Um, so there's a line in the budget concerning funding for the Sustainable City and Climate Change Fund. Can you confirm that the intention is to use reserves to cover this saving, um, meaning that the current programme will remain unchanged and on track, please? Kai, I think Kai's coming in here. Yeah, hi, Philip. I, I can um, answer that. Yeah, so the, in, the intention is to use earmarked reserves to cover the, the, the saving identified in the general fund. But I think the, uh, the other important, important point to make is the sort of external funding that we're attracting in to, to develop work in this area. So um, we recently accepted to um, the European Union Horizon Programme, um, 100 Climate Neutral Cities, and also, we've, we're, um, we're pursuing an Innovate UK bid as well, which potentially could be worth about £8 million if we get through to phase two. So we are, we are looking at external funding as well to boost the work. And obviously, as well, you're well aware that we've um, just signed the City Leap Agreement. That um, should see at least £424 million invested in decarbonisation over the next five years. So we're you know, really, I think we've done really well in this area obviously the uh the, the tightness of the budget at the moment has, has meant we've you know had to look at other sources to to cover the work that's going on but that work will continue un, unaffected i would just add to philip but there's a, a subtle a subtle point to make here it, it's not a fund for necessary for the projects it's the cost of running the service um so if the service can be run cheaper but enable us to identify and deliver the same sequence of 
uh, uh, regeneration, rebuild projects that need to happen, such as Leap, for example. You know, once, once, once Leap starts moving with the retrofit and uh, so forth, then we'll get that. It doesn't necessarily impact on the, the funds for the works. But as Kai said, we are constantly out there hustling to get, you know, to get the money to get the uh, to get the city rebuild done uh, too. Do you have a supplementary? Um, yeah, is it right that there's um, the part of the city leap provides? Is it about one and a half million to support community energy projects? Um, if you could just get a bit more detail about that, because that sounds like it could be really positive. Yeah, there's two. There's two. Um sort of pots of money via, via the procurement. So it's, it's 1.5 million from a community um, energy development fund. And also over the 20-year over the uh, partnership, there's uh, 2.8 million from a community benefit fund. So that, that's the commitment from Amoresco, our partners, but the details of that are being worked on at the moment. And we should be in a position by March, I think, to sort of um, come out with a lot more detail on, on how that's gonna work and how community groups can access that fund, those funds. I will add, actually, it, it, we've had quite an interesting uh, couple of weeks. So, so um, I went to COP as part of uh, 3CI, myself and Susan Aitken, leader of Glasgow, who hosted COP27. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in um, Sharm El Sheikh. Um, we, since coming back from COP, we've done, I think, what government should have done. Um, so what we've done with 3CI, as you'll be aware, we've identified the 200 billion pound pipeline of decarbonisation investment opportunities. The idea is that we work together as London councils, core cities, key cities, Scottish cities, um, and with, um, with UK cities catapult, package that up so it's more ready for market. So we'll be better able to leverage the private finance, to connect the private finance uh, with those opportunities because what, what they want is scale. The Mark Carney's identification of $140 trillion, one of the things that stops that money being spent is it doesn't have to scale. Now as a UK, we're starting to off offer that scale. Um, so um, uh, just within the last week or so, I, I had um, conversations with John Flint, who's the chief executive of the National Infrastructure Bank. We're saying decarbonisation is about our infrastructure, our underlying city systems. They're looking at City Leap, actually, how they can take City Leap as a template and support it with their own expertise to be replicated in other cities across the UK. So you begin to get massive scale. And when I was at an all-party parliamentary group last week on the sustainable development goals, one of the points that was picked up by one of the partners was, what if we turned up to COP next year with 20 cities pursuing 20 City Leaps? All right, just like Bristol. You don't have to have them all in place, but they've taken the first three steps. And there was quite a lot of excitement that we could turn up as a UK, set an international standard of decarbonisation activity. Um, we also had a, a, um, a, a call last week on Friday with Vijay Rangarajan, um, who is the, uh, uh, the um, Director General in the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, and he leads on climate, energy, and the environment. And he's now responsible for coordinating the UK's approach to COP. So I had a, myself and um, VJ had a one-to-one, -one, and then uh, on Thursday, we convened about 15, uh, there's about 18 actually, of the key organizations that were at COP from the UK with VJ, and talks about how we develop a national plan to lead into the next COP. And part, a big part of that is about money, getting the investment we need. So there's a lot of activity going on. Be really happy to share more with you outside here. Okay. Um, so the next question is from uh, Brenda Massey. Brenda, there you go. Yes, yes, I'm here in the back row. Um, please, can I, can Councillor Cheney confirm the local crisis prevention fund has been protected for the next financial year and also explain how it will be funded? Yeah, thanks, Brenda. Um, so the local local crisis prevention fund is about a seven hundred thousand pound fund that people can bid into um, when they're in financial difficulty to buy things like school uniforms or um, white goods, for example. It has a particularly special place in my heart, I suppose, because when I was young, I um, at least in part grew up in a single parent family, and our cooker broke at some point, and the council did buy us a new one, and we were able to continue to heat and eat food. Um, so it's something that we've kind of fought to protect all the way through. This year, we've proposed a reduction of £350,000 of that fund. However, we we're only comfortable doing that because we knew we were receiving some grant funding from government called the Household Support Fund, which is 
I think it's about eight million, um, and we'll be taking money out of that to supplement the gap in the um, in the household support fund. So that paper will be coming to cabinet next month or the month after, w which will also cover the range of other things that we'll be doing with that, including um, free school meals for the Easter holidays and so on. Okay, um, you have a supplementary, Brenda. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I do appreciate that clarification, and I asked because I know that this issue is important to. Bristolians, and I didn't want the budget report to cause any confusion. Um, I've got another question as well. And this about the, the capital plan is 3.5 million of spending on parks and green spaces in 23-24, which is very welcome. And I've got lots of groups in my ward who are very keen on this, so they'll be pleased. And I wondered if Councillor King could provide details of how this will be spent, please. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Massey. Um, yeah, it's, it's a whole heap of things, so I'll, I'll sort of reduce it down to some of the main themes, but it's, a lot of it's the area committee funded projects for Section 106 and SIL funds, um, which is, uh, for, for those un uninitiated, is, is pots of devolved money to areas where councillors can work with community groups to bring forward projects to increase the value um, of their public realm and, and such as playgrounds and paths and things like that. So I really encourage you all to get involved with that if, you, if you're interested. Um, so that's a, that's a good portion of it. Um, a lot of it's play refurbishment and maintenance, um, sports improvements, including some of our muggers, which are multi-use games areas and uh, providing lighting for some of those areas. Um, infrastructure like small bridges in parks, um, equipment and capital repair program to keep all our, our machinery up to date and current for we we need new tractors for our new ways of rewilding and, and growing our grass in different ways so we'll, there is a lot of new equipment that's needed to to push forward our ecological and environmental agenda and uh, footpaths both maintenance and creating them to make our parks more inclusive and accessible etc so a supplementary Yes, um, just following on from that, the HRA spend on projects like retrofitting, improving communal areas and bathroom replacement programme, they're also important to residents in my ward and I wanted to know if I could have confirmation these programmes remain unchanged. Tom? They remain protected but there are changes i think one of the things for us for example since we calculate the cost per bathroom um is that has shot up so we're still in protecting the overall investment but there'll be reduction in the number of bathrooms so yeah we're still protecting those investments um just because of inflation though it's there may be less for the money and that that's been a, the, the, that brenda is like i said at the beginning end as you'll be very aware it it's the plans we have but the context within which we're trying to deliver those plans has just become a lot more adversarial uh, to us as well but i will say one of the things i'll pick up that we were looking at with tom was as we replace those bathrooms making sure not only are they nice aesthetically but actually they're more water efficient uh, for example and we're saving this is what i mean about doing those hard yards behind the scenes that no one notices more water efficient bathrooms over the course of twenty-eight thousand properties we have is you know millions of liters of water a year that we're not drawing on with all the energy it's taken to, to to clean that so you know we're looking for those victories wherever we can uh, wherever we can get them okay thank you uh, so let's move on we have two questions now from councillor heather mack would you like to ask your first question yeah thank you marys um in the corporate strategy with reference to employment it states growth should decarbonize there's a lot of language around um sustainability and climate but this language is missing from the budget summary um when did we did you deprioritize decarbonizing this city yeah well i, I haven't um i we i think we've been through quite a few things to say today so if you disagree with that, we'll have to agree to disagree, but we haven't really prioritised it. There's a significant cut happening to the Sustainable Cities Fund. That was quite a, mis a confusing answer we had a minute ago. Reserves aren't stopping the cut to the Sustainable Cities Fund. There is about a third of the money from the Sustainable Cities Fund being cut. So that is the action. You know, There are actions behind that that we are cutting our sustainability work. Is that correct? No, what, what, what I made the distinction, as I just shared with Philippa, one is there is a real budget, and as Jeff and I talked earlier on, there is no way of 
doing meeting our legal requirement to pass a balanced budget without there being a hit in the city. And we've gone through a whole list of areas in which we're prioritising uh, Bristol people, be it making sure our welcoming places are uh, supported, making sure children are fed, making sure we're keeping um, houses being built, all of which I would suggest actually are climate interventions, by the way. I know we can have a very narrow view of what climate is, but supporting people for a just transition by making sure our children are fed, have the emotional and the financial space to think about existential threats that are coming down the path in 15, 20 years, you know, is part of that as well. What we talked about was a, a, a reduction in funding to the service, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a change in the, in the outputs, particularly when you think about the very serious fronts on which we are currently working, uh, not least on on work around the environment that, all right, outside the knockabout that happens in this chamber, the work that we in Bristol are doing on the environment, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally, has been incredibly well received, which is why we keep being asked to go and speak uh, and contribute to all these forums, uh, you know, around the world. And not just myself, but Kai, but Tom, but, uh, but Asher. But uh, I, I, know, I know the game is, is fine. It's, it's about the co trying to convince people that you're the only people that care and we don't care, and that's, that's okay. But it doesn't help the quality of debate and it doesn't help us build the coalitions we're going to need if we're going to deliver the scale and, uh, uh, of change at the pace it needs to be delivered. But did you have a second question? I did. It was around the capital spend. 2% of a primary objective to reduce carbon emissions. The capital strategy mentions providing sustainability and resilience. Um, and I just wanted to question that sort of gap between our priorities of sustainability um, and the overall money that we're spending in terms of the capital fund. Well, everything we do is about trying to redesign Bristol to be a more inclusive and sustainable city. Even if something doesn't look like a, and it doesn't look like a climate project on the front end, the kind of values we've driven in, if you look at Bristol Beacon, driving that, which is an incredibly difficult building uh, to regenerate, but the, the way that we've actually driven in sustainability into that building um, is there, putting the sustainable development goals at the heart of our you know, agreements uh, with, with developers. Um, coming to Bristol to work with 3CI. So, again, I, I know there's not much prospect of a <laughs> reasonable back and forth, but I would just say to you, I don't know which direction you're leading the party or to your members, um, we may dis there may be a disagreement on strategy, there may be a disagreement on understanding, uh, but there is a, a commitment across Bristol to deliver in a city uh, in, in which that does not ask a disproportionate price of the environment for meeting the needs of a growing population. That's the challenge we are uh, trying to, to take on. And if you, if you ever would want, as a group, to not try the one-upmanship, but to sit around a table and say, we recognise these complex problems, uh, we'd like to be part of coming up with some solutions, then you know we'd be open to that. But the, the sad thing is, in my six years, the biggest disappointment has been uh, the, the adversarialism of of your party, I, I will say it's been incredibly uh, disappointing and you seem to continue leading your group in that direction. But did you have a supplementary question? I, I think that we would like to have conversations about the proportion, the, what do you say, disproportionate effect of growth on the environment. I think that how we manage that impact on the environment is really important and we'd love to be involved in those conversations, but that's not happened. Well, again, relationships you know, and, and, a, and this kind of thing here. If you want to build a relationship, there needs to be trustworthiness in it. Um, if you want to come forward with some solutions, come forward. I did ask you when you were very first elected, I asked you to come into my office, tell me what your priorities are. You didn't seem to have any priorities. And I haven't seen any, heard, really heard anything from you outside of that, except for kind of attacks, when I actually had a one-to-one -one with you and said, what do you want to get done in your time? Um, you know, the, the door is open. There are different forms we've set up for the Environment Board, the one city, you know, approach that, that people are free to uh, to feed into. But there you go. The I mean, Environment Board that councillors are not sorry, allowed to be on. It's, it's, you can come. That's, but that's, that's a cheap, if you attend, as, Heather, you've, you've been at the one city gatherings and, and you, you came to a one city gathering with all of our city partners, took part in that very inclusive process and then spent your time wielding it around as, a, as, a, a, as, a, as an example of undermining democracy. So it's disingenuous to, to say that. It may, be, it may get a cheap laugh, but it's not true, though. So, you know, and actually we protect that space for our city partners. But again, if you want to do serious relationship building and politics, let's do it. If you want to play games, you, you're welcome to it, but I'm not playing. OK, so let's move on now. We have questions from Councillor Martin Fodor. 
No, Martin? Okay. Uh, we have a question from Tim Y. Tim. Thanks, Marvin, and probably Helen as well. Um, I'm not asking this generally to try and understand the proposals, although I appreciate sure you might go into them in a bit more detail next week, Helen. Um, it's regard to the sort of staffing savings and social care of one and a half million, which are significant. You know, the libraries get the headlines, but this is a significant challenge for us. And I just would really just want to understand the, the detail of the proposals a bit more. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> particularly how kind of how much of the savings is going to be frontline staff that are responsible for kind of doing our recruit our assessment function that's obviously statutory. And particularly, and also within that, the kind of reference to reducing agency costs. I'd like to be great to hear some more details of that. Um, and the second, I'll just put the second question there as well, because they're kind of linked. Um, it refers to kind of non-statutory areas of, fund, of responsibility that we're going to go down. I know some of those, but obviously, but I'd like a little bit more detail on that. And particularly concerning, I think, is what the impact will be on our sta more statutory responsibilities. It refers to delivering them in a different way, but I, I want to understand that and particularly how that might impact, the reduction of staff might impact on our existing transformation um, programs and reductions like section 117 for example can i just say i've been warned we've had a quite a long time on public forum so helen are you going to come in for tim but no so i appreciate the question as craig said adult social care is that wicked challenge facing local authorities everywhere so it's serious politics serious question and i we appreciate that but i'm um, helen thanks thanks marvin and thanks tim for the question and I mean, in this area, as you know, Bristol is not alone. Every, this is a challenge that's faced by every local authority or every local authority that has the responsibility. And what we will be doing is making sure that the staffing who are responsible for assessments and all of those things that lead to how we deliver our statutory duties for those people who, who we have a duty for will, will be there. So, so your question about frontline, we'll try and avoid that at all costs. It's going to be more about making sure that our management um, structure is, is fit for purpose. And although it's, it's a chunk out of our budget, as you know, we haven't been able to meet our um, budget estimates over the last few years because of obvious reasons, the additional demands of COVID and increasing um, prices for providers. But the 1.5 million equates to 3.9 of the staffing budget, so proportionally it's not as high as, as, as um, your question perhaps indicated. So recruitment is a major issue and we're talking to all sorts of organisations across the city. We want to be able to find new people who want to come into health and social care. We're not just grabbing people from different providers and, and we're getting them because the chances are they will move, move on to other places as well. So um, recruitment is a big issue across other sectors. So I think there's a, a city conversation to be had around recruitment and finding new areas, both diverse populations and perhaps some economically inactive people and bringing those into the workforce. And section 117 isn't affected. And thanks for emerging your question. Certainly, I should honour. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, no, I th we'll go into the level of detail as, as this process unfolds. That's probably enough for now, so thank you very much. Thank you. you. I mean, Tim, you might be interested in the work we are going to do with the NHS about looking at this whole system as we go into the integrated care system approach. Um, we're getting uh, some intellectual support from the universities as well to think about systems. Uh, and we know it's part of a national problem with our system. Uh, uh, but we're saying what victories can we get within the Bristol, Baines, South Gloss area? I've still got the right authorities, haven't I? North, North Somerset, BNSSG, okay. <laughs> uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with it. You, I'm sure you'd be welcome to be part of those conversations. Yeah, I'd be very happy to be involved in that. Okay, for time, we've got three more statements from councillors. Um, I have got uh, Councillor Brown, uh, Barry, Parsons. Barry Parsons, not here, David Wilcox, Andrew oh, Andrew, yeah, I've just mentioned Andrew, so we're going to come to you in a second, Andrew, but in this order, Andrew, David Wilcox, and Heather Mack. Okay, I'll give you one minute each. Thank you.
Yeah, I think I'm going to largely reserve my remarks. Um, you've had the statement, hopefully it's been read. It's on the public papers for anybody else who's interested. Um, but ultimately, um, nothing I say tonight is going to change the decision that's made. So I'll largely reserve my marks, remarks until full council. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Mary. In February 2022, it is my pleasure to raise a budget amendment to increase the number of civil enforcement officers by 18 so that the roads of Bristol will be safer for pedestrians, cyclists and drivers and congestions for all vehicles will be reduced. At the time, I tried to engage with the Highways Department in discourse about creating my first budget amendment, but I received minimal traction from the Highways Department. However, the amendment was signed off by the Section 151 officer and endorsed unanimously by full council. Even you voted for it. Later on in the year, I did ask the Section 15 officer if there was any means of tracking the progress of budget amendments. There was no process in place for members to ascertain this information. On inquiring with the head of highways in May, I was told that they had recruited five more CEOs and were looking to recruit more. On Friday the 20th of January, 10 seconds. Last, January uh, last Friday, I received an email from the acting head of highways telling me that the budget amendment was unfeasible. The budget setting process of this council is currently broken. Its okay. members are not adequately supported or informed of the council's financial status minute, David. to create valid budget amendments. Thank you. Um, so, and Heather, your uh, statement, please. Yeah, I will um, summarise. I've said much of it already. Um, this, although we've had more money from the government than expected, this is still a cuts budget. And I am on scrutiny and I do understand how we've got here and the difficulties um, in, in setting a budget. Um, there is, over the um, previous years, issues of mismanagement and, and costs of Bristol Beacon and Bristol Energy, and that has impacted this. And for years, Greens have called for a more strategic and holistic approach to the budget that takes into those long-term costs. Um, the environment has been treated as an afterthought in this budget. There's been cuts to our Climate uh, Sustainable Cities Fund, and Greens have had proposals such as meant minimum energy efficiency standards and workplace parking levy that could have raised money and funds um, to help be carbon neutral and to help this budget. Ten seconds. Oh, that, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, can I ask any cabinet members if they want to comment on this? Item, and Craig, you've said a few words already. Right. Any others? No? Okay. So, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's been a huge piece of work. Uh, thank you to the officers and the team. Um, one of the, our reflections over the last year is, is just how complex it is to run a city, so many moving parts. Uh, there is no way of us going through the financial journey we've had to go on over the last uh, uh, seven years without there being an impact on the city. Uh, uh, local authority, our public sector partners, uh, likewise being hit, particularly with the interest inflation and in impact on the labour supply and, uh, uh, and, and material supply uh, ec echoing from Brexit as well. So um, it's been a challenging time uh, for us. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you all for your comments, your questions, uh, your statements. Uh, and now I'm going to hand back to Councillor Cheney to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on your screen. Thank you, Marvin. In terms of the decisions we made today, I approve the recommendations are set out in the report. Thank you, Craig. Uh, so, agenda item nine, dedicated schools grant. Um, actually, picking up on Jeff's point earlier on, proposal for 23-24, uh, and I'm going to ask Asha Craig to bring this item. Uh, thanks, Marvin. The uh, budget report seeks to provide the full detail in relation to the dedicated schools grant better known as DSG, which is a ring-fenced government grant earmarked for education and centralised local education funding. The grant is established over four main blocks, the schools block, central school services block, the high needs block and the early years block. And this report sets out the proposed use of the DSG and how associated block funding is to be applied during 2023 24. The Bristol Schools Forum has been consulted on all aspects of the use of the DSG and has provided its approval where required on specific budgets and the decisions on the amount of funding to distribute to schools and early year settings along with the feedback for Cabinet and Council to consider. 
The Council has a legal responsibility for the overview and management of the grant. The distribution mechanisms, the proposed spend on central services and the high needs budgets are matters to be determined by the Council. The school funding regulations limit the scope for how funding may be used and there is limited flexibility to move money between blocks or charge Council services. The DSG allocation is 453.2 million for 23-24 which is a uh, 29.8 million pounds or a 7% increase from 22-23, within which the school's block budget will be set at 323.8 million with 1.6 million of the overall school's block transferred to the high needs block and earmarked to support the education transformation program. Following schools forum agreement, the central school's block budget is set at 2.7 million. The high needs block budget will be set at 88.1 million after receiving transfers of 1.6 million from the school block and the early years block budget will be set at 38.5 million. The level of government funding for the high needs block remains insufficient to meet Bristol's need. It is forecasted that after an increase of 8 million or 10.2% this is likely to result in a, cumulat uh, in a cumul cumulative deficit in the high needs block in the region of 62 million by the end of March 2024. The, the additional funding will not mitigate the budget pressure in high needs and it will not reduce historic accumulated de deficits to which a resolution will be required by March 2026. So the uh, um, concerns uh, that, that were raised um, earlier by our, our Chair of Scrutiny, uh, Councillor Gollop. Um, oh, <laughs> unfortunately, my, my computer has decided that it's going to kind of re rejig itself. But the point IT. is, I'm, I'm presenting <laughs> this report to you, and yes, we are looking at ways in which particularly to mitigate uh, the concerns. If there's anything that keeps me awake at night, it is the growing deficit within the DSG, and we have to find a way of managing that, and we are working on an action plan uh, with government um, to enable us to uh, get on top of those. So. Well, well the, the, the laptops are um, what, a living <laughs> example of why we need to continue to invest in do the unglamorous investment in IT as well, keep, keep the council <laughs> moving. Uh, so we've received no public forum statements, uh, but we've had two public forum questions. Uh, two questions are from Jen Smith. I don't think she's here, but let me just check. No, okay. So no engagement on that. Um, can I ask any cabinet members if they had any comments on this item? Great. Probably just to, to quickly kind of reiterate what I just said, the, the deficit in the DSG is incredibly important that we get on top of it because it has the potential to destabilize the council's budget which as we've already talked about is already in a fairly perilous position so work to do um it won't be easy but you know there are things we have to do ultimately all this stems back to underfunding of the education program by national government along with underfunding of the council by national government which is a kind of perfect storm another perfect storm Thank you. Let me hand back to you now, Asha. And again, just on that point, this is a this is part of a national story, uh, uh, you know, around this. But Asha, let me hand back to you now to take the decision, which I support, and will now be displayed on your screen. Uh, yes, I do want. To, before I take that decision, I do want to make the point uh, that we are not in this alone. Um, I, I think the DSG deficit affects maybe over 75 percent of local authorities across the country so we're not in this on in, in this alone uh, but in order to take the decision i um uh to be made today i approve the recommendations as set out in the report thanks very much asha so on to agenda item 10 housing revenue account budget proposals tom you're bringing this one thank you the HRA budget report covers the rent setting for council tenants and the proposed increase for non-dwelling rental income. It also covers the updated five-year capital programme for delivering much-needed council homes and investing in existing council-owned housing stock, including how we'll finance it. 
For 23-24, the prox budget is 137 million, with this report also seeking approval of a five-year HRA capital programme uh, of 865 million pounds. Cabinet is also asked to note that there has been a substantial update to the HRA business plan over the 30-year period. We were expecting perhaps a more light touch update this year, but given all the events that have happened in, in recent months, um, we've done a more in-depth uh, reflection on the financial model. Um, this plan will still be reviewed an annually with a periodic gateway review as well. It it's been a hugely challenging time for the HRA and council tenants, and we are seeing a range of pressures. Inflation of up to 20% in some parts of the service, additional funding required to address fire safety and high rises, market capacity challenges to deliver projects, and the financial pressures tenants are facing due to a Conservative government enabled cost of living crisis. This has made difficult decisions for us as a local authority and brings me on to what we're doing around rent setting. For this year, we're proposing to follow the current government guidelines announced in the autumn statement to apply a 7% rent increase cap. In the previous year, rent was calculated using the prescribed formula in the rent standard, which is consumer price index inflation plus 1% as of the end of September. We should be mindful though, this is off the back of a 1% rent reduction for four years between 2016 and 2020 following the Welfare Reform and Worked Act. The rent increase of 23-24 without government intervention would have been 11.1%. So instead applying 7% leaves a loss of 4.7 million and obviously has knock-on implications for future years rental income. What it will do though is a mean 9.3 million of additional income with the 7% rise when compared to the 22-23 projected outturn. And just in terms of affordability, um, it's worth just noting that the BCC proposed weekly average rent of £90.76 doesn't exceed the local housing allowance and also highlight the 65% of BCC tenants are in receipt of state support through housing benefit or universal credit that will absorb the additional costs in part or in full. The rent setting will also be supplemented by an anticipated drawdown of 6.5 million from HRA reserves to ensure we can deliver on our commitments with minimal negative impact to existing programmes. And this has meant we're continuing to make big investments in Bristol and current and future council tenants. I just want to set out a few of these. 1 million for the HRA park and play area refurbishment programmes approved by Cabinet in October. 4 million to renew housing IT infrastructure, pretty topical with the laptops. Um, 12.5 million over the medium term financial plan for a bathroom replacement programme. 8.7 million over five years to improve standards in communal areas, blocks and estates, which is 2.05 million for the next four years. 80 million to invest in energy efficiency and reduce carbon emissions through further wall insulation schemes and a program of photovoltaic panel installations. This will ensure all homes reach the minimum EPC of C by 2030. We're also making a significant investment in fire safety, totaling £97 million. This will see the removal of all EPS cladding from our high-rise blocks within 10 years. Funding for waking watches until alternative simultaneous evacuation alarms are in place or the cladding is removed. And a sprinkler installation program over five years for all high-rise blocks at Progest projected cost of £32.7 million. Pounds. This will see £408 million invested in the housing investment programme to improve and maintain existing stock over the next five years, alongside £453 million to develop 1,715 new council homes over the next five years. As I've referred to, the 30-year programme is not without its risks, as we, like the wider council, are exposed to interest rates, inflation, market failure, government policy on future rent increases after 24-25. Full details in relation to the annual budget, the capital programme and 30-year plan are outlined in the Cabinet report, along with the Equality Impact Assessment, and I recommend the HRA budget to Council for approval. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, uh, sadly, we, we haven't had any public form statements um, or questions on our housing and revenue account. Um, but can I ask any Cabinet members if they'd like to comment on a housing crisis and delivering house? Uh, uh, Don. Yes, I have uh, lots of uh, uh, council tenants in my ward, and I just want to say that um, thanks to Tom and thanks to officers for maintaining this really strong vision for council housing in the face of uh, government policy, which hasn't always been helpful. Um, not only that, maintaining the council tax reduction scheme um, I'm, I'm proud to reach this last one of our budgets as an administration and to be able to say that the people I came to this job for, um, to stand up for, 
I feel we've done a really good job for them, and this is evidence of it. And uh, thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Don. Any others? No? I, I, only, only very quickly, having been through the process with Tom, or a lot of the process with Tom, what was supposed to have been a light touch has become a, a huge exercise. And I suppose I just want to thank the housing officers, the finance team, and everyone else who, who've managed to maintain the vision, who've managed to maintain the council house building programme, which is probably one of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious in the country, um, all the while protecting residents from the, the issues of cladding and so on that, that we know are, are um, sort of unfolding around us at the moment. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, nothing, no process we've been through as easy as it seemed that could have been at the start. So many, so much has been broken, needed to be fixed. So let, let me hand back to you now, Tom, uh, to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on your screen. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. So on to agenda item 11. So Craig's going to step out for this, uh, for declarations of interest. Reasons. I'm going to introduce this report. Uh, this is the Bristol Beacon update. So the cabinet paper uh, that we've put out shares the scale and complexity of the challenge of delivering uh, the Bristol Beacon. We have, uh, we have a listed asset in the centre of the city uh, that had to be closed. We face a decision between letting it become almost like the postal office sorting site that used to be behind Temple Meads, but in the middle of Bristol, closed and deteriorating in the centre of the city, or committing to its uh, restoration. And we committed to its restoration uh, with the support you know, of the city. But we've had to make incredibly difficult decisions at every stage of this project. The initial phases brought delays caused by discoveries of Victorian structures. There were also unexpected and severe structural issues that became apparent. Walls were crumbling and in need of immediate stabilizing or um, in uh, rebuilding uh, to be able to take the new structure and meet modern uh, safety standards. Some columns were hollow or just filled with rubble. In hidden corners, there were rotten timbers, cracks, defects in the masonry. Um, asbestos was found all across the, the roof and in multiple um, other areas. Um, and there were three um, unknown wells as part of the chimney flues that appeared to lead nowhere, but meant there were gaps um, under the walls, as long as, a, a, as well as a, a very severe um, uh, flooding uh, water uh, uh, problem uh, at the venue. Uh, talking to the contractor, they said it was like having to go backwards uh, before you went forward. We expected some of that, but people had to go even further backwards just to go forwards to make sure that whatever was done met modern uh, building uh, standards. Um, these discoveries uh, also, I would suggest, demonstrate how little work has ever been done on the building over the decades, including um, an absence of any real structural work at the time that the new wing was added back in 2009, like putting a, a conservatory on a house without dealing with structural defects in the house. So at this stage of the project, where we are right now, uh, the, the funding was shared between Bristol City Council and the Arts Council with some fundraising included. We decided to add capital investment to the project because of the important role the Beacon plays in the city's cultural um, offer, and I mean the greater Bristol region. The, the later stage of the project has added costs due to the increase in the supply chain caused by inflation, interest rates, and Brexit. Uh, and these are pressures that are affecting the entire construction industry. Now, when I think about all of all that I've listed here, uh, the, the physical challenges of their building, as well as that inflation interest and the, the Brexit and supply chain impact, any of those factors by themselves uh, uh, would, be, would be unfortunate but manageable. Uh, but they've all come together to hit us with a really incredibly significant uh, headwind. But at this stage where we are now, we face three options all of which we've costed. Option one is to continue uh, to complete the works and open um, in this autumn. That comes in at uh, 25 million pounds on top of the existing uh, project cost. Option two is to pause the work for a year, uh, restarting in a year's time, with the aim of opening in around August 2025. The cost for that comes in at around 60 million pounds on top of the current uh, spend. A third option is to stop the work in its entirety um, and wrap the building up and leave it to a future administration to decide if they'd like to start the work again uh, and go to completion. The cost of that comes in about £95 uh, million. Pounds. Um, I think the numbers speak for themselves, as they often have uh, with the programme, and we're deciding today uh, to complete the project. 
Uh, the future of the venue and the capital cost incurred along with the loan repayments drives the need also, I would add, uh, to view the building as a revenue stream uh, for the city. It changes the context within which this, uh, this building um, lives. So included in the recommendations is a principal decision to drive revenue. And in doing so, we will engage with Bristol Music Trust, who have been managing the building since 2011, uh, to talk more about the commercial arrangement, as well as in tandem, testing the marketplace for commercial operators. Uh, final decisions on future contractual arrangements, arrangements will return to Cabinet uh, uh, when they are clearer. So we are very pleased to be completing the project. Uh, I'm not saying it is, I mean, as I made clear, it's come with a uh, major challenge for us. Um, but all other things, I think it's, it's been, the, been the right move. Um, and we will return a modern, world-class, refurbished, uh, sustainable arts venue to uh, the centre of our city. Um, so on this report, we've received one public forum statement, uh, and that's from Dan Ackroyd. So Dan, if you're here, you have one minute. I'll give you a 10 second warning. So we're going to hear today that the huge increase in costs at the Bristol Beacon couldn't have been foreseen. I previously asked if YTL could be required to commit to running the arena in Filton, even if it was at a loss to them. The answer did not address the question. It's not obvious enough that enough people will be able to actually get to the venue in Filton, particularly after the temporary car park is replaced in building, with buildings in 2030, leaving less than 2,000 parking spaces for a 19,000 person arena. I'm not sure it should be worse that a council could be tricked into spending taxpayer money to, to benefit a developer without adequate guarantee that an arena would be operated or a lack of attention to detail that allowed public money to be spent in an uncontrolled way. Just 10 seconds. Please, can you learn from the failure to monitor risks in the Bristol Beacon renovation and take steps to ensure that Bristol does actually have an operating music arena in Filton for years to come? It'd be a terrible legacy of this council to have lost out okay. on having an arena at all. Thank you. Um, I would just say, we, we, normally the, the statements have to be in line with the actual agenda item. This agenda item isn't, is not about the YTL Arena, it's about Bristol Beacon. Um, and YTL is being, they're investing in that, it's all at private finance risk. The Bristol Beacon is about our capital project. So they're actually different projects. Well, we're not developing the YTL Arena. We're doing the Bristol Beacon. So they're different projects uh, with different owners. Yeah, but uh, we'd be happy to share more with you about Bristol Beacon or YTL outside of here to, to get clarity on that. Um, the, we have uh, two questions now. Uh, the, f uh, the, the first uh, is from uh, Councillor David Wilcox. Uh, thank you, Maurice. Uh, today is absolutely the last day when a decision can be taken to meet a September 23 opening for the Bristol Beacon. The Bristol Music Trust has already announced the opening. Sorry, Councillor, got, can we actually do the question? Because I've got your question here, and I, I, we, we don't really have time for long statements hidden as okay. questions. So if you can just ask your question, that'd be great. Why is the Bristol Beacon project hidden in a generic risk CRR 41 capital portfolio delivery? It should have a much higher profile so adequate scrutiny by members could be given to it. Simply passing the risk to our strategic partner, Arcadis, looks like it's brushing it underneath the carpet. Okay, so I mean, it's not possible to brush Bristol Beacon under the uh, carpet. It's one of the biggest stories in the city at this moment in time. Uh, we wouldn't want to uh, as well. We've actually wanted to engage people in the complexity of delivery uh, because it has been such a challenge. So we want people to be uh, uh, wrestling with those challenges. Risk CRR441 by its very nature includes the Bristol Beacon, by the way, as it as it has consequences across the capital portfolio and operational risk registers captured the project risks and issues and were escalated using the, the set out governance uh, uh, both corporately and politically and scrutiny can pick up any issue it wants to focus on. Did you have a supplementary? Yeah, I just don't think that's adequate for a, a project that's going to saddle Bristol City Council with two and a half million pounds of debt every year for the next 50 years. Okay, uh, well, um, and members, I'm told as well, just had an exempt briefing on this just about two, two weeks ago, so information has been uh, forthcoming. Um, I, I mean, I'm 
again, I, I don't know if there's anything that would actually satisfy you. So I'm, not, I'm just going to say we've done all we can to be um, open with this in the context of, of sensitive negotiations that we've been in with the developers and, and the partners involved as you know as well. Um, so I, I think you had a, did, let me just check here. I think you had a second question as well. So if yes, we can focus on the question, that'd be great. Yeah, in June 2022, uh, Grant Thornton uh, made 13 recommendations about how to improve the management of the Bristol Beacon. Can we share those recommendations and whether they are actually adhered to, please? There's an echo of this from, from something your leader said earlier on in kind of representing or misrepresenting what happens. Those publication, those recommendations were published in the Grant Thornton report um, at Audit Committee in June 2022. So they were published at the meeting. I mean, you can, if you missed it, I can ask officers to get the link and send it to you so you can have another chance to look at the report. Uh, in, in addition, I can ask officers to provide you with confirmation of how the recommendations were implemented um, if, if you would like that. The, th the 13 separate recommendations were not listed in the report. I was at that audit meeting. Well, we'll check and we'll make sure uh, you've got them. Um, but it was could, June. Be very good, it, we're, we're six months later, so we can ask this any time. Just come to us and, and we'll do that. It's not a problem. Did you have a supplementary? I'll take that. Your comment as not the supplementary. No, I don't. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, next one, we have a question from Councillor Annie Stafford Townsend. Okay, not, not attending. Uh, Barry Parsons, non attendance. Um, I think that's us. Have we got one more here? Uh, okay, that's a second. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's it. Um, any cabinet members wish to comment on this item? No? Okay. Well, as I said, it's been a huge challenge uh, for us as a city, but um, I think when this uh, venue opens up, we will realise just, just how significant it is for Bristol, making a huge contribution to our city centre and wider city region, uh, you know, economy is a, is a major magnet, but that commercial, that, 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 that revenue raising element has to be a part of that, that future uh, relationship. But in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Let's move on now to agenda item 12, South Bristol Youth Zone. Asha, you're bringing this item. Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to um, seek approval for the allocation of funding for the South Bristol Youth Zone to approve the schedule of works to deliver the youth zone and the authority to lease the land. Uh, for those of you who don't know, youth zones are purpose-built spaces with incredible facilities providing local young people affordable access to high-quality sports, arts and leisure facilities and activities as well as specialist support such as careers, housing, mental health and substance misuse, which will be available through a network of services and resources. The youth zone will be built in the south of Bristol, serving children and young people in some of the most disadvantaged wards of the city. And feedback from the engagement and the consultation has been highly supportive of the South Bristol Youth Zone and also of its location. The youth zone will bring ambition and regeneration through significant internal investment to the south of the city and stands to contribute significantly to recovery through symbolic and practical support for children and families within its catchment area. It also brings around 30 permanent full-time equivalent jobs for youth workers employed through the delivery organisation Youth Moves, whose footprint is already embedded in this area. Project costs for the building are to be met through a 50% investment from Onside and Bristol City Council, who are asked to commit £4.2 million to the youth zone, of which £4 million was identified in the capital programme. Separately, the council is required to commit an additional £3.275 million for site abnormalities such as ground levelling and site and safe access. Cabinet approving this will enable a world-class youth facility in a priority area of the city, operating to a proven model of delivery, which gives the provision sustainability at a time of great uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Asha. So, really exciting uh, project, and, and one you picked up from Helen, who was obviously a real 
fan of this as well, uh, GT, uh, Godwin T, I should say. Um, we've had a statement, but I don't think the council is here. Councillor Jackson, no, okay. Um, and so that's one public forum statement. Uh, we'll record that. We've got questions. Uh, one from Christine Townsend. Councillor Townsend. Um, yeah, do you know where the um, four million of the philanthropy that's coming from on site is actually coming from yet? So, firstly, we're really delighted that we have a partner who can bring uh, four million pounds of capital contributions to Bristol's youth services. We've been working closely with Onside on all aspects of the project, and they are open with us um, as, they've re as they have received pledges covering the remaining capital costs of the youth zone, which totals 65% of the total project costs. This includes support from St. James Place Foundation, which has extended its partnership of Onside to Bristol, amongst a group of other patrons, some of whom requested that they are not named. Vetting is carried out against all donors, however, we will respect the privacy of each donation. The attention really is now turning to the building of the Youth Zones family of founder patrons who will collectively provide unrestricted funding towards the Youth Zones running costs. Uh, they're in the process, I know, of uh, recruiting a senior philanthropy manager uh, who will be recruited to um, manage that process. Did you have a supplementary or did you have a kind of an inside track on it being some kind of funny money? No. Okay. No? No. No. Um, okay. The uh, report mentions Lawrence Hill um, as an area, uh, as an example. Um, where is the intention for children to come from Lawrence Hill um, to go to that? Because it is quite a long way away, that's all. It, yes, it is a long way away, but, um, you know, we're not London. I, I, I've had the opportunity of going to the, the youth zone in, in Croydon, amazing uh, facility, uh, um, and, but it's open to everybody in the city. So um, if, the youth, um, if the youth project or a youth organisation in another part of the city wants to get a minibus and take the kids over or get on a bus, and take the kids over for a session over at the youth zone, then they shouldn't be stopped in doing so. It's for, it's for everyone, but the main beneficiaries will be the children and young people of South Bristol. I mean, I'd say, Asher, it's like, yeah. I mean, it is going to be local to South Bristol, which is but incredibly important at this time. But in the same way as a youth intervention might take young people to a different part of the city to, I don't know, ice skate or rock climb, there's going to be fantastic facilities there and we can get young people there. So we, again, part of the pre-work has got to be with uh, youth services and schools across the city to make sure they, they see it as a, as a city, uh, uh, city asset. Um, did I can I just actually also add, I think what's also uh, really um, great about the project is even though it's going to be managed time. and run by uh, youth, youth Moves in totality, it will be a partnership and a collaboration with a whole host of other youth-based organisations who will right. either have a presence there or will run sessions uh, from that activity. And I think, again, most importantly, it's, it's young people are going to be at the heart of the design. They're going to name it, they're going to design it, they're going to come up with the colour coding right. system as they have done with the other zones in the area. So, Thanks, yeah. Asha. Um, any cabinet members, Helen? Is this it's your part of the world. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were looking at me then. Thanks, Marvin, and, and thanks, Asher. And, and Asher's last point, actually, about, about Youth Moves are the uh, lead organisation, but um, certainly Ali Dale and others from Youth Moves have been making those connections with other providers. And the, we haven't got a major provider in, in South Bristol. It's a whole patchwork of lots of smaller organisations, so um, CYN and Young Bristol and, and others that, that work, but there are some of the community organisations, I'd say Hartcliffe and Withywood Community Partnership, for one, because obviously it's in my patch, but they've done the coordination with those groups so that there's a whole programme of different activities for young people on every night of the week. And that's established those relationships much better between the providers. So they're not seeing this as, you know, it's going to be um, treading on their toes, but it's going to complement the offer because 
Obviously, not all of the youth activity will happen in the youth zone every night and nothing else will be happening. There will be lots of other activities and, and young people will be signposted to the youth zone. It's very, very exciting and I was pleased to see that um, Chris Jackson, our colleague, councillor in Philwood, across the way from, from me in Hartcliffe and Withywood, uh, welcoming this development and seeing how it complements the um, levelling up funding that's gone into Philwood last week as well. So, you know, it's it's a brilliant opportunity and we just need to knit all of these things together. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, yeah, in incredibly exciting for Bristol in general, but uh, South Bristol um, in, in particular as well. Um, any other cabinet members like to comment? Tom. I think just briefly, it's it's fantastic to see this investment, which you know will predominantly benefit people in South Bristol. And I think it also shows that we often hear f from people as well talking when we're talking about sort of the housing we're delivering across the city that we're not investing in infrastructure. And I think this is a really really good example of of where we are making that investment and going and working to secure the additional funding to to make sure that we can really improve people's lives in areas of of high deprivation as well. You know, for me, it's you know the, the Labour Party in action and, and why I got involved in this party to start with. Thanks very much, Tom, for the uh, broadcast. <laughs> OK, any of the cabinet for this? No? OK. Asha, um, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. So in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. OK, Asha, we're staying with you for agenda item 14, the local area send re-inspection from October at 2022. Oh. oh, sorry, I jumped ahead. I uh, had my pages stuck together. Uh, agenda, third, agenda item 13, DfE capital funding to develop two new children's homes. Asha. So this paper seeks approval to use the Department for Education's Children's Homes Capital Funding Grant of £911,000 to develop Bristol City Council-owned properties to create two new children's homes and approve commissioning a provider to run those homes. The care population in Bristol is growing and it's likely to rise by 5% in the next year and we are already struggling to find placements to meet the needs of our most complex children. The first of these homes will be a tier 3.5 uh, home which will support children with mental health needs to live in the community through a collaborative model of delivery with health, education and social care. This will in enable medically fit children who require clinical and social care to be discharged from hospital settings within suitable timescales. The second is a home for adolescent boys aged 15 uh, to 17 with challenging and aggressive behaviour. This will provide a therapeutic uh, setting uh, for restorative care for young men with criminal justice involvement and where exploitation is part of their risk profile. This includes two self-contained pods in the grounds as preparation for independent living. Bristol City Council will commission a pro provider to run the homes once developed and the local authority will have responsibility for working in partnership with the provider to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our children and young people. This work forms part of the Children's Transformation Programme, creating more locally based homes for children with complex care needs. And Cabinet approving this spend will help us to try and reduce the number of children who are placed in expensive placements outside of the city, improve outcomes whilst reducing our overall expenditure. Thank you. I mean, this, this paper comes in the context of what we know is a, uh, you know, a growing pressure in the lives of children and young people and the circumstances around them and the, the, gro the, the growing urgency for us to be a good corporate parent as, a, uh, as an authority. But as we've shared at one of the city gatherings, uh, being a city in which we, every child has a home, which is what we aspire to be, uh, but we're fa faced you know, heavy challenges in being that city is not just down to the council, it's down to the whole collection of organisations that, that, uh, that run the city and everybody uh, that lives here. Um, uh, and uh, we, we have a growing population. Our young people have been under phenomenal pressure 
Families have been under phenomenal pressure, particularly over the last few years. That pressure is still with us. So we anticipate more need coming through the system. So we have to begin to uh, increase our ability to, to support in our system. As I said earlier on, existential threats in 20 years time are very real. Uh, but what we also want to do is create the emotional and financial space for, for people who are too, e too easily left behind and left out of council debates to think about more than the next week uh, of, the, of their existence in this city, on this planet. So look, we, we haven't had any public forum statements on children's homes. Um, we've had no public forum statements on children's homes. Um, but can I ask any cabinet if they'd uh, like to speak? Helen. Just to say briefly that obviously we welcome this and I think there's, a, there's an echo here with some of the adult social care reports about having the provision within the city. It's the right thing for our people, whether they're young people, adults of working age or indeed older people. And we just haven't had some of the provision that addresses some of the complexities of some of the young people. And, and the uh, adults that, that we deal with. And obviously, we want to look down the line at, at, from the position of adults at these young people who are coming through and do everything we can to keep them in the city and get the provision right for them here. So certainly welcome this. And um, I don't know if Don was going to say anything about the um, provision that we've got at the Addison Apartments in, in C Mills that we've uh, done visits to now and it's an absolutely fantastic resource and is meaning that we've got homes for very complex young people coming out of young people's services and re-establishes them within Bristol their own city so thank you Helen Don did you want to come in yeah I think I've mentioned it before but I'm always happy to uh, mention it again Ellie and I passed by the other day on our e-scooter trip around the ward and um, it's lovely to, to feel that young people who would formerly have been um, kind of obliged to go to specialist care outside the city now find themselves in, in the heart of a little local community, which I'm part and I know all the community groups and everything, receiving a very warm welcome. And I feel, you know, so much more assured that these people for whom have got a responsibility, special responsibility, really, um, we know that they're being cared for and are wanted in the community. Thanks very much for your, your comments. Uh, Helen, I would just add in here, uh, you know, as well, when you're with adult social care, our constant drive at the moment in our conversation with government is to properly understand the role of local government and the interventions we make, the life course of health, um, early interventions with children and young people in building resilience so that people don't go age with adverse conditions in their childhood that turn into lifelong dependencies on adult social care and ultimately in the National Health Service uh, with all the needs that come. So uh, respecting our role as public health providers, early interveners on children is essential to making the future of this country affordable. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a narr it, it, it's an element of the conversation around the NHS that has been horrifically missing uh, over, well, for a long time, a long time. Okay, thank you all. Let me hand back to you now, uh, uh, um, Asha, to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Again, just before I take the decision, I, I just want to add as well, we, uh, you know, it's great that we are and we need to do more um, to uh, develop more in-house provision here in the city because we are currently at the mercy of the markets and the market is killing us uh, financially it's it's you know it's so expensive to send some of our children outside of the uh, outside of the city and so uh, er anything and everything that we could possibly do to create more provision for children and young people right here in the city is what is required so um, in terms of the decision to be made today i approve the recommendations as set out in this report Thank you, Asha, and for your leadership in this area. So let's move on now to agenda item 14, local area send reinspection, October 2022. Okay, so this report seeks to inform Cabinet of the outcome of the October 2022 Ofsted and Care Quality Commission's local area reinspection of Bristol's send reforms as set out in the Children and Families Act 2014. The paper also seeks approval of the next steps to deliver the recommendations.
The report's main findings show that four of the five areas highlighted in the 2019 inspection are showing sufficient progress in addressing key areas, leading to better outcomes for children and young people with SEND here in Bristol. Council staff have worked at pace to improve services and outcomes for children in the city. Children and young people have been at the centre of the city's recovery from the pandemic, demonstrated by Bristol's belonging strategy, uh, which I was proud to launch in October of 2021. The improvements outlined in this reinspection took place during the pandemic, a time where new working practices and new duties also had to be undertaken. Inspectors judged that difficult relationships with parents and carers found at the last inspection had continued. However, the report goes on to note that the majority of parents and carers accessing services and support more recently are positive about their experience. Plans are progressing to re-establish a formal body to represent parents and carers in the city. The reinspection formalises the progress we have made, but there is still more to do to ensure that children and the young people with SEND uh, are appropriately um, cared for. The new SEND partnership plan will continue to build on the improvements made and tackle areas of weakness identified in the inspection, the reinspection report and the feedback from our partners and indeed parents. We are in conversation with the Department for Education about how to progress an accelerated action plan to improve uh, Area 5 uh, relationships with parents and carers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Asha, uh, for that. Uh, we have had uh, three public forum questions. Uh, we've had one public forum statement. So the statement's from Unison. Uh, are you here, Unison? Okay, thank you. So you have one minute uh, to make your statement and I'll give you a 10 second warning. Okay. Thank you for this. Um, I'm speaking on this agenda item in line with the recommendations within the report. I'd it is sort of a question because I'm imploring the council to rethink their proposal to close <coughs> St Barnabas Primary School in St Paul's. This is a wonderful resource with two sanctuary rooms, an enclosed play space, a forest school, a 4G... you listening? No, he's not listening. Never mind. 4G sports pitch. We understand there's falling pupil numbers within the um, area, but there's at least two new builds in the area with starter flats. Also, other schools in the area use the facilities and some are close to being full up. We have numerous members within... Yeah. Within here, oh, just 10 seconds. Skilled in SEND provision and support the pupils. You could lose their expertise in the recruitment issue within the, within the council. Lastly, SEND Barnabas okay. could be used as an assessment centre and clear the backlog of educa education packages, the assessments. Right. Okay, you have a thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we did, let it, we did let you complete, but we are trying to make sure that the statements of questions are about the specific agenda item. We do have to manage... Uh, cabinet like that, otherwise cabinet would just become a whole mix of statements about whatever, uh, whatever and what then would be an unmanageable uh, debate. But y y your point taken, I right, and we'll, bet we'll we'll take that into account. Thank you very much. Um, now we have questions. There were three public forum questions submitted uh, from two councillors. The first two questions are from Councillor Tim Kent. So Tim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the report talks about the area where reasonable improvement was not demonstrated, the fractured relationship between parents and the local authority. But nowhere does it mention the SEND social media monitoring nor the external investigation. Please could you provide us with an update on the investigation called for by both People's Scrutiny Commission and full council? So just to clarify, this is the, 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 the um, feedback I was just gave you was around the DfE um, reinspection. It had nothing to do with the, the social uh, media uh, situation. So the mayor already has had agreed that he would consider an external investigation on the social media uh, monitoring. However, we've decided to take no further action until we've seen the outs outcome of our Ofsted inspection. This report has been brought forward to update Cabinet, uh, as I said, on the outcome of the local area SEND inspection. 
its main findings, the judgments against the five key areas for improvement identified in 2019, and the next steps that are required in response. So we're delighted that the inspection shows significant progress uh, and the inspectors were made aware of and considered evidence regarding the fractured relationships during the inspection. And we're content that we will go forward with the parent care arrangements already announced uh, uh, and which uh, continue to progress well. The inspection, uh, and I will also make the point that the inspectors were also made aware of the social media concerns and they did not comment on it. Uh, a supplementary, Tim? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Supplementary to that answer. I mean, clearly we have here the results of the SEND inspection. I am very confused which inspection you're waiting for to begin the investigation. Uh, we have now waited several months for this. Can, so can we actually make can, it a can question? Can you confirm exactly when an investigation into the behaviour by the council is brought forward? Because clearly that is a major impact on the fractured relationship between parents and this local authority. I, Ash, I will let you speak, but if I can just, just chuck a couple of things, because we do, it is, the, it is one of the things of getting used to coming into this organisation. I know I've been here six years now, but I didn't really have much to do with the political machinations of the city before I did come there, I worked in the health service and in the voluntary sector and so forth. But one of the things that has struck me since coming here is how we love to, th to throw around hyperbolic kind of descriptions as a matter of course to try and buff up the conversation in this area of subterfuge and confusion that's mentioned and all that and often what we're doing is we're working out complex situation i just think it helps the quality of the debate if we don't do the kind of full council bingo here with whatever kind of words we can to suggest things are a lot more you're uh, the only one who's used can that I just word, finish? Mr. Mayor. sorry i'm chairing the meeting tim but we'll we'll get our a chance to come to your question now i just say it improves the quality of debate that's all I'm suggesting, but you're entitled to carry on debating the way you'd like to. But Ashley, would you like to um, respond to the statement stroke question? So the inspection I'm talking about is the current Ofsted inspection that ends at the end of this week. Um, as you know, um, the inspection started on the third week uh, when our new uh, director, exec director, uh, Abby Gabego, started. So she is um, looking at all of the outcomes of all of our inspections, including this one, and they will be wrapped up uh, in the kind of um, response that we give to uh, both uh, the camp, both yourself as councillors, uh, and also the um, DfE when we respond to their findings. So. Um, we can go on to I'll, second. I'll have question. a yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll have a response for you. You know, by the beginning of next month. Do you have a, your second question, Tim? Thank you, Mr. Bell. I'll ask my second question. Just to clarify, I think the wording you we can had just do the, was we, fractured. We can just do the that question. was actually the inspector's wording, not Tim, mine. Tease, question Tim. two. Thank uh, you. As mayor, are you confident that the uh, equalities impact assessment for this report is adequate? I note that the report claims that there are no equality impacts, which seems very unlikely. So I'll take this, Marvin. So the EQIA for this report makes it clear that individual EQIAs are being produced alongside the Accelerated Progress Plan and the SEND Strategic Partnership Plan that are being prepared in response to the report. This is where the agreed actions can be evaluated in relation to equalities impact. There was supplementary, Tim. Thank you. Just a very quick supplementary then. Um, uh, just to follow that up, uh, the, uh, the actual um, parents' voice on co collaborations now been suspended by the council for a year. Uh, that is sort of within the report. It says it's going to continue now for at least several months. Do you not think that has an impact upon the outcomes of disabled children in this authority that their parents' voice is silenced? Well, interestingly enough, as you said, um, well, for the last year, we have been engaging over 23 parent groups across the whole city. The first time that um, the voices uh, that are diverse and inclusive and their voices are, are, are being heard and they have been engaged in the process. We have a meeting later on this week with the consortium of groups and that is actually on the agenda. So watch this space. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, and thanks very much for your questions, uh, Tim. I mean, I think it is important to recognise, and having come from voluntary sector in the city, 
myself as well. There is never any one voice that represents the full diversity of Bristol. And it can be the case that sometimes uh, groups that occupy the centre ground are not as inclusive as we would like them to be. I'm not saying it is necessarily the case. I'm just saying it can be the case. And, and it's important for us as an authority to, uh, to make sure that we're very proactive in making the space for more voices to come through. Sometimes people feel silenced by uh, existing uh, voices that occupy that centre ground with lots of power. Um, so, uh, as Asha said, it's, we've, we've taken the opportunity to speak to a wider range of people, not all of whom have been uh, supported by kind of existing, uh, uh, existing platforms that have been taken by people. Okay, so let's move on now to the next question from Christine Townsend, Councillor Townsend. So mine kind of follows on really. I'm just wondering if they, if you've got the timeline yet as to when the contact um, grant for parent carer to support the current carer uh, forums will be officially given over to Bristol. So as I said on, I think it's this Friday, Thursday or Friday, Thursday, I think we've got a meeting of consortium of groups where contact will be coming and making a presentation about the process for uh, uh, funding going forward. But what I will add also is that, as I've just said before, we're working on the accelerated progress plan, and this will include a whole range of milestones around establishing co-production across the local area. And in the interim, we have already agreed that parent and carer representatives attend key strategic meetings with members of our community um, of groups, and this is progressing well. In fact, I got an email today confirming representatives from uh, supportive parents and autism independents who will be um, joining us on our strategic board. So, OK, do you have a supplementary? Yeah, thank you. Um, is Bristol expecting um, Ofsted to come in again to look at the SEND? No. Yeah. Okay, did you hear that answer, Christine? I think they will come. Uh, I think after we've finished this inspection, I'm sure the SEND will be part of a wider inspection and in three, four years' time when they, they, they come again. So unless there is cause for concern, the answer is no. Okay, thank you. But again, we'll stay in touch about that. Okay, so um, any other cabinet members wish to comment on this? I said a few things already, so I won't say any more. Okay, so Asha, let me hand back to you now to make the decision which I support and will now be displayed on the screen. So in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations set out in the report. Thank you. So let's move on to 15 now. Adult Social Care Discharge Grant. Uh, Helen, you're bringing this item. Thank you very much, Marvin. And uh, as there isn't any public forum on this report, sadly, um, I'll be very quick in, in, uh, rep in, in um, delivering it. So £1.69 million in the, in the face of the scale of the challenge isn't a huge amount. And Unfortunately, this is given by the uh, government to, was given to us in November and has to be spent by the end of March. So the point that you made earlier about making the, the point about adult social care's role in helping solve the NHS crisis is very relevant here, isn't it? Because you've got to spend it, plan what you're going to spend it on and spend it in, in four months, which is crazy. Um, Sadly, also, you know that when we watch the news night after night and they talk about the crisis in the NHS, unfortunately, there are some uninformed views that then come out of that, which say that the reason why people are stuck in hospital is because of the failings of local authorities and adult social care. So the 1.69 million has to be spent to do the things that are the right things to do to establish those pathways from hospital into the future and not undermine the work that we're doing and unfortunately again the government has given 
uh, hospitals, which you can't, di you can't disagree with at the moment because the situation is such, but they've given hospitals or trusts money to purchase places in care homes when actually what we know is the best route for people when they've been in hospital, particularly older people who decondition very quickly if they're, if they're stuck in hospital, is to get home with the right support so that they can maintain an independent lifestyle. But the report identifies in great detail what that 1.69 million is being spent on. And the, the uh, programme of works also went to the um, Health and Wellbeing Board. So it's a partnership approach to spending that money. But obviously we're not going to say no to the offer of government money, but we do have to be careful that we don't undermine doing the right things just because we've got to spend it quickly. Thanks, you, Helen. As you said, you know, really unfortunate. No public forum statements or questions on the biggest financial challenge we face. Uh, but can I ask any cabinet members if they wish to comment on this? Craig? Well, I mean, I need to reiterate, reiterate Helen's point, really, about, um, you know, receiving funding so late and expected to spend it so quickly. It's yeah. just not really any way to run a country, particularly, I appreciate it as a crisis, but it's a crisis that's 12 years in the making and we should have been able to... We should have had processes around this for a long time. Instead, we're frantically closing the door now. I mean, I'd add to that as well, Helen, when you say about being grateful for the money. We say this about le levelling up money we got uh, just last week, 14 and a half million. And I did the PM, PM show last week. We're, we're, we're glad to get the money, but it doesn't take away from the brokenness of the system of local government finance. The, the, the instability that's stitched into our financial standing, which makes us a less reliable partner because we don't have the financial security ourselves, which undermines the local conditions for investment and planning from our, from our partners as well. So uh, we take it, um, but we issued a challenge back at the same time as um, offering uh, solutions uh, through, through LGA, uh, um, through core cities and the other forums through which we, we work with national government. Okay, H Helen, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and um, which will now be displayed on the screen. Sorry. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, Helen. And so, agenda item 16, learning, disability and autism, uh, uh, section 256, funding. Over to you, Helen. Well, this, this is another... Um, package of, of, of money, 3.3 million in, in this case, to be spent on learning disability and autism. We are spending it across the BNSSG, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire footprint. And it goes back again to what we've been saying this afternoon on several occasions. It is about having the right provision in Bristol. And we haven't been very good at that in the past. So making sure that we can provide the right, either residential settings or uh, day activities, making sure that we're tying into what uh, parents and carers want for their children, but also for those, for those um, people who come through the transition services from children's services into adults and that we've got more of that provision there. So 3.3 uh, million is, is welcome and we want to spend it in line with the programme that we have with our partner councils. Thank, thanks very much, um, Helen. Again, uh, we've had no um, public forum statements or questions um, on this item. Any other cabinet members? I suppose the echoes carry forward, don't they? Just uh, the way local government is financed, piecemeal, mm -hmm. short-term, competitive, surprise, here's some money, spend it in four, four months or so, and rather than allowing us to build a budget that that we can have a predictable journey over the course of uh, years, uh, years ahead, four or five years at least <laughs> within that. Um, so, Helen, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thanks, Marvin. And in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you very much, Helen. My own IT issues, but that's about not planning ahead for my charge in my laptop. <laughs> okay. To rallies, that's what I did. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're with you um, again, Helen, for agenda item 17, funding for adult care packages. This is an important report because whilst it is um, 
giving the director the authority to sign off uh, spot purchases that are outside our framework, it also acknowledges that there's a huge amount of work going on to make sure that we start really reviewing the packages of care that people get and getting the best providers and the best provision for people, but at prices that we can afford. And I think the point was made earlier by Asha that some of the uh, children and young people's providers have kind of got us over a barrel. And I think that has been the case in adults, but we're certainly getting more and more control of those uh, packages. And I think that that means, it, it doesn't mean taking the big stick to those providers, it means working alongside them and making sure that um, those packages are reviewed regularly and that those providers are also responsible for a progression. So we shouldn't assume that somebody who needs a, um, a, a particular package of care at the age of 25 when they come into adult services will continue to need the same package for 30 or 40 years. It will be constantly reviewed, but in, alongside that, we have got to develop the local market, and we're talking to some national providers and some local ones about both flexing and um, fle flexing what they do and bringing in some new services. But this does give us the permission that that where those um, packages are out of scope, that that we can sign them off. But that is done with a panel of officers who look very carefully at what's being proposed and those costs. Thank you, Helen. Um, again, our, our, our similar challenge, when the, again, the, the challenge we have uh, of tackling our care services, uh, local authority, uh, but thank you for your leadership on this. Any cabinet members wish to comment on this item? Okay, well, and uh, let me hand back to you to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. So in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations set out in the report. Thank you very much, Helen. So on now to agenda item 18, uh, funding for independent domestic violence advisors. And Ellie, you're bringing this item. Thank you. This report seeks approval to accept £550,000 of funding from the Ministry of Justice for the next two years to fund eight independent domestic violence advisors, or IDVAs, working as part of the NextLink Plus service. IDVAs help victims of domestic abuse navigate their way around what can be a complex system of support services, reducing the stress that is often reported by survivors who need help finding the right support. They become a beacon of safety and trust and help survivors streamline the complex and often traumatic process of rebuilding their lives. And this method is backed up by feedback from survivors. This responds directly to a key recommendation in the Mayor's Commission on Domestic Abuse. It is worth referencing our other new services that have also responded to the Commission's recommendations. Our respite rooms provide intensive support to people with complex needs who have suffered domestic abuse. We have a survivors forum who provide invaluable support to each other and also feed into the council's approach as a critical friend and last year created their own event for the sector. And our Iris advised service supports sexual health staff to identify and respond to the signs of domestic abuse. We have also extended support for male victims and child survivors through our new burdens funding delivered through the NextLink Plus service and our therapeutic sexual violence services jointly commissioned with health partners with involvement from those with lived experience in the procurement process. Our great work in this area was recognised recently with a visit from the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for England who visited our services and we fed back on the challenges that we continue to face. It is hoped that funding for IDVAs will continue beyond 2025, and the paper asks that Cabinet delegate, delegates acceptance of any future extensions to the Exec Director of Adults and Communities in consulta consultation with the lead for public health, and will, continue, will allow us to continue this essential work. Sorry for uh, using that to hijack and talk about the other things that we're doing. I'm just very proud of, of the domestic abuse services that we offer in the city, and it's rare to get um, any questions or interest in this kind of a paper, so I took the advantage. No, thank you, Ellie. And, and we think back to the journey, and I think you gave me an update the other day, Tom, on housing, our journey around domestic violence. In Bristol, we came in with that commitment to offering priority housing for women fleeing or uh, well, surviving uh, domestic violence. And I just want to say, a lot of people claim, try to claim credit for that, actually. Some campaign groups, everyone's... 
but actually the credit was with 125, the charity work, working with women in street prostitution. I went to see 125 before the 2016 election, sat in a room and asked the women, if we could do one thing, what's the one thing you want us to do? And what they said was we need priority housing for women fleeing domestic violence and abuse. And it took some time because you got to look at the bandings, but then we delivered that and you updated the other day. Amazing work as you referenced there. Um, Jonathan, who's now gone on to greater things from our office, but worked with Sue Mount Stevens and yourself, Helen, and, um, and, and yourself, Asher, as well, on, uh, looking at all of our domestic violence services. And what we found is that individual services can be good, but the collective offer does not work together as a proper system, so women can end up falling between the gaps. Uh, so the effort was to look at all of those services going on and get much better join-up and linkage uh, to, so that women get the wraparound support and don't end up falling into those limbos between services. So some great work, and now you'll lead in uh, on this as well. And it's worth mentioning the work, again, that Sumat Stevens and you know, talked about very early was PHSE for children and young people, so that young people know what good relationships are and can see the warning signs early about what is abuse uh, uh, you know, in all its many forms, uh, so we can begin to build that resilience into people's lives early. But this is another, you know, just another uh, contribution to that. Can I, can I offer the floor to any uh, cabinet members? Um, Asha. Yeah, I just um, obviously I welcome the, um, uh, the this resource and to kind of just follow on, you know, when we brought together all of the key agencies, I think we had about 60, 70 different uh, representatives uh, of all of the main organizations that interface with women who are facing domestic violence. And so it's great to see that many, nearly all of the recommendations, we're looking at the, the kind of the action plan, but it, all of the recommendations that were set out in that plan, we have collectively um, and uh, working collaboratively with other partners delivering on this agenda. So this is really, really welcome. And I have to um, say, I've, I've been really impressed by the services that um, have been delivered um, through NextLink and many of the other services on this. So well done them. Thank you, Rasha. Um, are those, uh, Craig? I, only quickly, I, I mean, domestic violence is not something that we talk about enough as a nation. It's not something that we talk about enough in Bristol and it's probably not something we talk about enough in the council either. So um, it's great that Ellie took the opportunity to, to speak more widely about, about the things that are happening. Um, but also this, you know, this small amount of funding is going to deliver a huge amount of, of change by helping people to navigate through these complex processes. So um, I just really welcome it and, and I thank Ellie for all her work on it. Thank, thank you, Craig. Okay. Well, Ellie, thank you for your uh, ongoing leadership on this. Let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you, uh, Ellie. So on to agenda item 19, using uh, City Regional Sustainable Transport Settlement, the CRSTS, livable neighbourhood funding to complete street space and related schemes. So, John, uh, Don, you have the honour of presenting this very catchily titled initiative. Thanks. I'll try and keep it short, Marvin. Uh, the report seeks Cabinet approval to submit a bid to WECA to both secure CRSTS funding to complete a full business case for schemes and subsequent funding to impl implement all such schemes provided the full business case is successful, which will total $5.2 million. Uh, the schemes are Princess Victoria Street, Cotton Hill and King Street, which are for improvements to the physical interventions now that we've, um, the uh, regulations have been made permanent. Uh, there are new closures proposed for two roads, Overton Road, which is off of Gloucester Road, and Rosemary Lane uh, near the local primary school. And we also allocate a £10,000 contribution for cycling improvements to a project on St Mark's Road. The trial pedestrianisations of Cotton Hill, Princess Victoria Street and King Street have been huge successes and have shown how popular pedestrianisation schemes can be when in the right place. This cabinet paper allocates funding to help improve the street scene where these have now been made permanent. I very much hope and expect these successes can be replicated in other locations such as Chandos Road and Overton Road. The 
Chandos Road Festival shows the street thrives when it's closed to cars, and I went there a few months ago. I hope that by doing this, we can bring the same benefits the festival does all year round. As well as opening up more space, space for the street's traders, this will also free up the road for pedestrians and cyclists and create a new active travel route through Redland. Many of these schemes have already been publicly welcomed by ward councillors, businesses and community groups. However, schemes will go into consultation once signed off by WECA. Finally, Cabinet will note that a risk register was published in error alongside the report, as this referred to several schemes not considered in this report since being removed from the Council website. And um, personally, I'd like to say thank you to those uh, very friendly and um, uh, polite lobbyists on Chandos Road and on Overton Road as well. Uh, do you know those kind of uh, lobbyists are the ones I... Um, I warm to the most, and uh, and today they've got their results, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Um, so we have had some activity on this. We've received uh, seven public forum statements. I'm pretty sure that most people aren't here, but I'm going to run through Abdul Malik, Abib Malik, Mary Stevens. Nicola Canning, Katie Evans, Naomi Stanford, Jane Tiley. Okay, so turning to questions, there were three public forum questions submitted from two councillors. First is Councillor Katie Grant. It's left. Okay. Uh, next two questions from Councillor Tom Hathaway. He's not here either. Okay, okay. Um, well, thank you for submitting the questions and statements. Anyway, we can uh, uh, take those in. Um, any cabinet members wish to comment on this? Uh, Nicola. Thanks, Marvin. Um, it won't probably be a surprise for nighttime economy perspective that I really welcome this um, paper and that continued focus and emphasis on bringing tarmac back to people um, generally across the city. Don, thank you very much. I know it's not easy. I know we've had a few robust conversations about this issue over the last 12 months, and so I'm really pleased to see this and um, much more of it, please. Thank you very much. Cheers, Don. Reminds me of that, um, what's the guitarist from the 60s and the 70s? Jimi Jimi Hendrix, cross town traffic, tire tracks or the crash your back, baby. I can see you had your way. I'm sure you got tire tracks across your back, Don, from, from dealing with what happens to our road space yeah, uh, within the city, actually, right? So, um, anyway, let me hand back to you now, Don, to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. So, on to agenda item 20. And this definitely has tire tracks across your back. Uh, introduction of pay and display parking in district car parks. Don. Thank you. Um, this paper hasn't attracted quite as much interest as the next report, item 21, but in, in uh, a way it's quite similar. A review of our parking estate has recommended an approach uh, which makes this uh, part of the parking estate financially sustainable while improving the service by bringing parking fees into line with other parts of the city. The paper outlines the process that we've been through with the 16 sites, uh, which have been free to park at up till now. Two are out of scope because of development opportunities which have already arisen. Four with very low use are proposed to be sold. Uh, two of them are in my ward, Clayton Street in Avonmouth and Lawrence Western, Harden Road, Stockwood, Queens Road, Hartcliffe and Withywood, and Riding Lees, again in my ward. This brings a capital receipt to the council, which is much needed, uh, but also means savings on maintenance and fly tipping costs, unfortunately, and hopefully, eventually, a reduction in antisocial behaviour, which these sites attract. The remaining 10 locations listed in the paper will become pay and display with 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. seven days a week, four hours maximum stay, no return within two hours, 
one pound per hour. Just like other car parks, there will be no charge or time limit for blue badge holders. Introducing these fees will discourage all day parking, maximize the use of space and ensure effective turnover of spaces to support the local co economy. For these reasons, I'm pleased to present this paper to cabinet members today. Thank you, Don. So uh, we received 53 uh, public forum statements and one question um, on this. Uh, so I'm going to run through those I've been told are attending uh, or who have said they were going to be here. So Graham Barsby. Okay, can we get the microphone to Graham? This is a statement, Graham, so if you have it one minute. Sorry, I think the microphone isn't on. Can we just make sure that's working? I heard it ruffle then. But. Okay, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Graham. Um, I speak for myself. I'm an ordinary Westbury on Trim resident. I understand the council's need to raise money. Um, specifically, though, for Westbury on Trim car park, um, the doc there is on the boundary a doctor's surgery. Please could the doctor's surgery have six free car parking spaces because none of us knows how long it takes to see a doctor. Um, also on the boundary, there's the Methodist Church and nearby Parish Church, both of which run social programs, e.g. Ukrainian Hub, which reaches out to Ukrainians, Vietnamese, Chinese, Iranians and Afghans. To assist these social programs, please could the Methodist Church and Parish Church also have six free spaces. Um, generally, uh, happy with, um, uh, could, could there be 30, 30 minutes drop off? Just time. 10 seconds. Okay. Three hours for turnaround would be great. No selling space to business. We need this for the community um, and the elderly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your contribution. And managing the city space and finances isn't easy. You know, we welcome your, your contributions. We're making a decision today, but there's still relationships and conversations to be had about uh, what we do. And I'm sure Don would welcome, uh, welcome that. Um, we, I have, I've, no one else has, um, I've had no indication that anyone else on this item is, att is attending. So Robert, I, I know you, Jeff, I'm just going for the public. If you're from the public and you did have um, a statement or a question, I won't go for all the names because I've got so many, please let me know now. Okay. So Jeff, let me come to you for your statement on this then. You've got a, a minute. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marvin. Um, I fully understand that this has, has to be income generative. But we do need a viable community, and a viable business community within Westbury on Trim to continue to generate that income for the future. Current proposals are a threat to that. Jeff, your, your blazer is rubbing on the mic. Oh, so, yeah. sorry. Um, we have a real concern, and, and to have got 52 statements in the course of a week indicates the strength of feeling within the community. So all I'm asking, Don, please, will you consult with us and with residents, not about stopping this scheme, but how we can make it work in a way that will constructively engage and, as you said, encourage the local economy, not threaten it, encourage the volunteer organisations and not destroy them. Really important. These things are on our... We, we have this in every ward. We know these organisations are struggling and this sort of threat could finish off businesses and voluntary organisations. Talk with us and we can get this through. But the strength of feeling is such that this is only a sample of the objections that will come in when this is consulted on if we can't find some better solutions. I hope we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so we've had nothing else. Can I offer comments to any cabinet members? Uh, Tom? Just briefly on the, the Queen's Road car park, I know this is uh, going for disposal for community-led housing. So, you know, re really pleased to see that 
we're thinking about how we're using the estate uh, effectively across the city uh, to enable innovative housing. On Brownfield site, yeah. Okay, Nicola. Um, I appreciate again, Don, that this is one of those issues which is, um, you know, a bit of a kind of hold your breath moment and, and we have to do these things. I just wanted to welcome the inclusion of blue badge holders. Um, which I think has got to be absolutely true to our values to make sure that our high streets remain accessible to blue badge holders across the city. Thanks, Nicola. Okay, Don, let me um, hand back to you now for final comments and also to make the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you. And uh, Nicola's comments about blue badge holders are very pertinent. Not, not every local authority now offers free parking to blue badge holders. You can go around the websites and you can check on that. But there is obviously a cost to offering that all over the city. Um, and if we want well-maintained car parks, there must be an income stream in order to maintain those realistic income stream. But I thank everyone for their comments. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in this report. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don. Uh, so on to agenda item 21, which is one I think lots of people are here for, um, Bristol City Docks Fees and Charges Review. I'm going to introduce this uh, report. So it's been 20 years since the last Fees and Charges Review, and a lot has changed in that time. So a review of our fees is overdue. The city and the harbour both have changed uh, together over those 20 years. The population of the city has continued to grow. 395,000 people in 2000 to 472,000 today. And the use of the harbour has changed, where there used to be uh, a lot more businesses around there, business-based and warehousing, but now it's much more about um, individual boats. But what hasn't changed um, is uh, that this hasn't been as, as open and inclusive a part of the city um, as we would want it to be for the whole city. Uh, and while the harbour is synonymous with the city's identity, it's not equally accessible to all Bristolians. So we all want a fantastic harbour for all people from across the city and beyond to be able to visit, uh, to live uh, and to work in. And we, we do have a good harbour, but it's not at the level that we want or need it to be. But if we want the harbour to be all it should be, it means we have to invest uh, in the harbour and what's around it. So fees have actually fallen in real terms uh, and the harbour makes a loss. Uh, we need the harbour to become self-sustaining, which means raising the investment to fix the crumbling infrastructure and modernise the facilities. The importance of the harbour paying its way is even more so given the financial pressures on the council, uh, which means, among other things, that we're looking to reduce the, the cost of adults and children's social care uh, services. There's a pressure on parks, libraries, uh, that we've been holding off and all the other pressures we've worked through uh, today in, in our budget from domestic violence to new children's homes uh, and, and, and our uh, you know, uh, uh, emergency support uh, uh, schemes as well. So it's essential uh, for the city and for the harbour that it becomes self-sufficient. The fees recommended are in line with benchmarking um, exercises we've run and bring us back in line with comparable harbours and facilities to make this a commercial rate. These fees aren't introduced until April, and in the meantime, we will undergo a series of engagement opportunities with user groups to notify them of the proposed changes. And this will allow us to provide clarification and also give users an opportunity to raise any specific issues. Uh, so on this report, we've received one public forum petition and 79 public forum statements and 50 questions. So the petition is from George Colwey. Uh, so George, you have one minute to present the petition. I'm guessing you're there. There we go. I'll give you a 10 second warning as well. With just five days notice before the submission deadline, we have amassed a petition with over 2,200 signatures demanding Marvin Rees withdraw support for the new harbour fees until a consultation and impact assessment have been undertaken by engaging with all impacted stakeholders. The Mayor yesterday published on his website a piece attempting to pin the decades-long failure of the Harbour Authority squarely on the shoulders of boat dwellers, painting them as abusers of a system. 
He's also misrepresented a clause in leisure use licenses to BBC Radio Bristol and on his blog. This all demonstrates how ill-informed his office is. He's been swept up in a yarn as a result of his own neglect to uphold the democratic process and is now demonising a community of good working people. Just 10 seconds, OK? He clearly doesn't know about the four years of groundwork the Boaters Association has done to try and secure the very thing he has accused boat dwellers of deliberately avoiding, securing liveaboard licences. We even conducted a needs assessment of harbour users last okay, that's, uh, year. We that's have the data. Let us show it to okay. you. OK. Thanks very much. Okay, so we'd like to get through as many as we can. We have a finite amount of time for public forum, as I said at the beginning. So let's try and uh, move uh, through them, uh, the statements as quick as we can. Um, so uh, we have got a list of names. Please raise your hand when I call your name. I'll go to those people who have confirmed their attendance today. Uh, so the first is Alex King. Okay, Bristol Packet Boat Trips. Okay, you have a minute, okay? Okay, uh, Bristol Packet Boat Trips is a long-standing local business and an integral part of Bristol's uh, maritime and cultural heritage. We feel the proposed schedule of fees and charges unfairly targets commercial boat trip operators with some of the heaviest increases. In particular, the new £50 charge for opening Prince Street and Junction okay. Bridge will incur an estimated cost of okay, running the tower bed of more than £14,000 a year. When you add in the other increases, assuming the passenger carrying charges per passenger per trip, these proposals are expected to cost Bristol Packet boat trips more than 40,000 in harbour fees, essentially tripling the cost of our fees from last year. There has been no consultation of the impact of these increases, no notice period and no option for negotiation or phased implement uh, implementation. This has not been factored into our financial planning or higher rates or ticket prices for 2023 and will have a huge impact on our business. Any SME will okay, still ten to absorb these additional costs on this scale, especially when recovering from the impact of COVID, grappling with rising fuel, electricity and staffing costs. So we do have a, I just urge you, we do have a finite amount of time for public forum. We I will extend that, but the more the time that's taken up by reacting means less time we have for actually hearing the, the statements themselves. So I'm trying to make space for the, uh, the, the statements. Okay, so the next one is Alan Middleton. I would like to ask why there hasn't been an equality impact statement produced. The lack of this document must mean that the con committee cannot make an informed and accurate decision on the extortionate increase in fees. Can the committee agree that a decision will not be made until such a document has been produced in consultation with the harbour users? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, David Taylor. It's public statements. Um, thanks for listening to us. The proposed schedule of fees for harbour services have, have increased um, in a way that's unreasonable, much higher than inflation, and have the potential to negatively affect the Bristol boating community, some of who are vulnerable. Indeed, indeed, a significant number of households may be made homeless. The boat dwellers have been designated part of the GRT community by the council, despite what the mayor insinuated in his press statement yesterday, whose intentionally divisive language, calling them immoral and a privileged few, was upsetting to many of us. No consultation about these increases and how to implement them has taken place, despite being announced and supported by published guidance. The impact assessment submitted has not been carried out with any consultation to any stock stakeholder. It rings untrue. I urge you to hold your decision until appropriate evidence gathering, financial justification and proper detail has been provided and above all, wide consultation has taken place. The operational review of the harbour has not been made public, details have not been consulted and this means that the community cannot see the basis for the review of the, of the increased charges. I've been a boat owner in the harbour for 20 years and own a long... Uh, 
I'm a long-standing business owner in the city centre. I love the harbour and am part of a vital community of boat owners and harbour users and workers who would love the opportunity to share ideas and thoughts about its future. I look forward to us being given the opportunity to do so and That's postpone a any decisions made without further consultation. Thank you. Okay. Six seconds. Okay. Um, so, uh, Alison Pye. Uh, Andrew Pye, ben, e ben Ewing, hello, hi, so I'm, um, I'm here today for um, my family, uh, my young family, and I'm asking for your help and your protection. Uh, we are boat owners, members of Cabot Cruising Club, uh, members of Bristol Boat and Community Association, and owners of a small local family business. My wife and I are self-employed electricians and we have worked in, on and around Bristol Harbour for years, including events, infrastructure, for ferry boat companies and for boat owners. Um, I have a roof over my head and I provide for my family. I've been living on my boat for 14 years. I found out today uh, from uh, a website that the uh, mayor has put up that I am abusing the system and damaging the city's ability to manage the harbour for all, not for the privileged few. Yesterday, I was planning for my family's future. Today, I am vulnerable. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Carl Bowen. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. Uh, the rationale for this charging schedule is informed by the long overdue harbour operational review, but significant stakeholders like Bristol Boats Community Association, the two large cruising clubs, several commercial operators have not been properly consulted on either of the review or these hugely increased prices. Coupled to this, I'm led to believe that most of you guys have not had sight of the review either. So today's process is far from the standard Bristol City Council officers should be setting for informed, inclusive and transparent decision making. Even long established disciplines like the Qualities Impact Assessment has been circumnavigated by, effectively by a nil return. Instead, the Harbour Master is continuing to discharge his authority in a manner that's dismissive and disrespectful of those on and off the water he has a duty to serve and safeguard. Long gone are the days when we need a harbour master to be the enforcer of his own discretionary powers and rulings. Today we're needing the post holder to be someone who's a skilled and trusted public Ten facing seconds. marina and flood defence system manager. If this were the case, we would not be finding ourselves in this embarrassingly undemocratic quagmire with so many of the harbour's boat owners and other stakeholders okay, ruling against the harbour's Thank mismanagement, you. of which this is actually only one example. I'm Okay, I mean, because, it, because I'm chairing a meeting, I mean, people say what they want about me, but I would just say, uh, you know, I just ask people to act with a degree of respect towards other people out there and deal with the system and deal with the nature of the challenge, but the, the kind of the personalisation of those attacks is probably a little bit unhelpful. Um, so, uh, Michael Brunel, and we are short on time. We're going to have to go to a question after this because of the amount of time we're taking. Michael Brunel. Hello. Um, I'm not the greatest at public speaking, but I more or less agree with everyone else has spoken already. The um, increase to the, our running costs now, or, sorry, running costs, is, is going to make a massive effect oh, to the point I'm probably not going to afford to keep my boat anymore. That includes volunteering, taking older generations out on the water to the local restaurants and cafes on a Saturday morning. The older generations that have formed our boating club. So it's, it's, a, it's real disheartening to find out all this at such a late notice. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, statement. <laughs> I, okay, the, the, there was the point I was making earlier on about time. So because we've gone over that public forum, let me take the question and then I'll try and do a quick run through. And if we can ask people to keep the statements to like half a, half a minute, we'll whip through a few so everyone gets their chance to have their you know, to have their stand, okay? Um, so, okay. Well, I didn't want to say that, but it was the point I was going to suggest to everyone, if we can make space, yeah. Um, okay, so the question is from George Colway, who's attended. Yeah. 
You don't need to ask your question? Okay, well, let's give a few more. I think that was the only... And then we had a question from Bristol uh, Boaters Community Association. Yes. Okay. With a complete disregard to the existing boat dwelling community and without including an accommodation needs assessment, we consider the equality impact assessment to be invalid. How can the cabinet make an informed decision whilst disregarding the potential impact these proposals would have on people's homes? Uh, thank you. So um, our, we, this fees review is part of a much broader piece of work uh, within which the equality and impact assessment uh, was undertaken and it falls uh, within that. As I said, we, we make a, a decision uh, today, nothing happens till April, and in that time we will continue uh, to uh, work with people in the harbour side you know, and beyond. I suppose part of the challenge is we have eight residential licences down there, uh, to, uh, which dr drives that consultation as well as the people who, who are living there. We understand that more people are living there. Uh, uh, not necessarily on the residential licences, so that obviously brings a bit of a challenge to the, you know, the whole process. But as I said, the, you know, the conversations are there. The challenges of the harbour do not disappear. The challenges to the council finances do not uh, uh, disappear, and the challenges to us meeting our city um, housing crisis uh, uh, don't disappear. That is the context within which we're trying to better manage uh, the harbour, but there's no cost-free way of, of doing so. Did you have a supplementary? Yes, thank you. Um, from the article you posted last night, I felt personally at threat. Can you guarantee that the existing boat dwellers within the city will be looked after with residential licences? The boat dwellers with residential licences? Can you guarantee the existing boat dwellers in the harbour, which there is a vast significant amount of, and this new category of residential licences which you've put on the proposed fees, can you guarantee that people that need residential licences could possibly get them? Well, there will be a process that people go through to apply. I can't guarantee anyone gets any licenses. What I can do is guarantee that there is a process people will be able to uh, to work through. But yeah, well, it's part it's, it's part of the it's part of the review of the harbour. Uh, but the point is that today is just Where is the review? Where is the review? Where is the Okay, I'm not going to do ping pong. We'll, we'll talk and then we'll talk reasonably. We started the ping pong match, sir. Okay, I've got a second question. Could I ask it, please? I'm just going to finish off. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll, co I'll come in now. Okay. Um, so... I know it's painful uh, for people, but we have to do this review for the sake of uh, the, the future of the harbour. This is one element um, of, uh, of the review. Past processes have not worked. As we said, this is just about the fees. They've not been reviewed for 20 years. Um, across the rest of the city, we've had to look at things that we would prefer... We're just going to. Okay, I'm. We're going to run out of time, so it's the decision. But. Okay, so we're going to lose the time. The point is, the fees have not been reviewed for 20 years. I know that there's been inflationary increases, but actually the real terms, they've gone down, and it means that the harbour operates at a loss. One of the reasons for looking at how the harbour runs and bringing those fees in line with benchmarked uh, ports is so that the cost of the, so that we manage, which is a very challenging budget, and you've been here all meeting, you'll know the range of challenges we face. If we don't review those fees and we continue to effectively uh, subsidise what goes on down there, we have to go to other elements of the budget that we talked about tonight uh, to be looking, uh, looking at. 
And so I think we have to recognise that in the same way that council rents are going up, same way as some of our support packages are under pressure, same way as we heard today criticism from the Green Party about what's happening to the, the money around our sustainability team, there are lots of critical areas that are facing phenomenal financial pressure. You know, and as a city, we have to, we have to work out how we manage that. And as I said right at the beginning to Councillor Jeff Gollop, there, we recognise there is no cost-free, there is no impact-free way of passing, de delivering on our legal responsibility to deliver a balanced budget. And that's falling right across the city, uh, from Hartcliffe and Withywood to Lance Weston to Lawrence Hill, and, and including uh, the harbour. So we have to, this is a review that's, that, that's, uh, that's essential. I'm, uh, for the sake of, uh, of that openness we want, I'm going to take uh, one more uh, statement. Um, so let's have a, a look at who we've got next. We have... Sorry, could I do mine? I just, because um, Rachel Evans... So I'm just going to take two more. What did you say? Oh, thank statement? you. There's a, there's a gentleman. I don't know your name because it's not indicated on here. So I'm just going to take two volunteers. If I can take two, two hands, then I'll take two more... Uh, two more uh, statements from you. Bernie Rowe. Bernie Rowe. Oh, Bernie Rowe? Okay, Bernie Rowe. Okay, I'll tell you what, why don't you decide amongst yourselves who are going to make those final two statements, uh, volunteer the people for you. Okay, I think I'm allowed to do it for okay, the great. group. Um, there has been an equality impact assessment done, but the answer to the question, will the proposal have an equality impact, has been ticked no. And the discussion in the box says it will be ensured that the revised legislation regarding the Harbour Authority, which is complex and needs updating, will regard any equalities considerations. But we don't understand how this can happen without a discussion, because it's about communication. So you haven't asked anyone in the Harbour about how this will affect them. So this is what the problem is. There's been no communication. That's why everyone's really angry. Another point. So is, just another 10 seconds. Okay, 10 no. seconds. The okay. Savills Review, please. Which harbour did you look at? We, were you comparing like with like? We have no facilities in Bristol, very little. I have a pontoon, a hooker, okay. and water. If you're comparing with Weymouth, they have a totally different set yeah. of facilities. Okay. So we just want to know what that is, please. Okay. Thank so I won't, I'll just quick, but, but that very issue about facilities and harbour is one of the reasons we need to find a way of investing in the harbour and reviewing the fees that it actually runs. We, we can't invest within the current financial uh, context within which we operate. So we have to find some way of squaring that uh, circle. The second uh, statement that you've collectively agreed on. Thank you, sir. Your name, Bur sorry? Bernie Rowe. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, consultation informs and improves decision-making. It is evident that there has been none here, and unlike so many of the other items on the Cabinet agenda, where extensive consultation has taken place and which has allowed decisions to be reviewed and, in some cases, changed. Consultation is essential to good decision-making, and yet there has been none. And I'd ask you to defer any decision, engagement with boat owners or engagement with harbour users after a decision has been taken is of no value whatsoever. It's merely an information exercise. There needs to be a okay, proper just ten seconds. There needs to be a proper consultation mm. and and to address points like reviews of bylaws and also the harbour review of, of the report, which has not been discussed. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, the, the, the review, the whole review has been going on uh, for some time with, uh, you know, engagement in and around the harbour. Uh, we can send...
yeah, I mean, if you want to... So, uh, listen, I, we can, can have the conversation. Um, Again, as I said to some of the other uh, councillors early, you know, I do, you know, I'm happy to have conversation if we, you know, keep it as a conversation. Uh, what I've heard, and you know, I'm sorry if you've uh, felt hurt uh, uh, by some of the stuff that's happened. I, again, I, I would have to try to understand uh, why. Uh, but you know, what we've got a mix of here is kind of argument about the issue with personal attacks, and that doesn't create the conditions for a meaningful conversation that you say you want. Uh, so, you know, we can talk about motivation and not being able to organise a, a proverbial piss up in a brewery and all that type of stuff. You can have that kind of conversation, or we can have a, you know, a more rounded conversation about, the, you know, the, the full range of challenges that you've had privy to today, uh, facing the city as the context within which we try and take on the challenge of investing in the harbour, uh, with, that is good, but as I said, is not where we would want it or need it to be. You know, a great place to live, work, and to visit, one that's accessible to the whole city. And um, the, the, the race class geographical fragmentation of Bristol historically has meant that there are parts of the city that are not open to all Bristolians. And actually, uh, that investing in those parts of the city to make them accessible to all Bristolians, be that in terms of transport systems, be that in terms of you know, uh, financial ability to, to, to visit as well, is really important. Uh, be happy to have that conversation with you, but you know, be happy to have a reasonable conversation. We, uh, we have time to, uh, to talk with you all. Uh, like I said, nothing happens till April. All right. Yeah, we, we, we'd be um, happy to make sure that there's conversation, you know, about the, the, the future of the harbour and make sure that we're talking not just about the fees themselves and the fees happen in a context in which everything's becoming more challenging uh, within the city. We don't uh, dismiss that, we recognise that, but it happens within a, a review of the whole harbour as well. It's one part of the whole um, harbour review and we're happy to have that uh, conversation uh, uh, with you. Uh, and we, were, we are a city that, uh, well, I'd say I don't think it's been historically true because I've grown up, grown up here, but as a, as a leadership and I think it's, it's evident in the papers that have been brought tonight. We are a city that's, that's, uh, that's worked incredibly hard to make sure we're protecting the most vulnerable people uh, within the city. Hence the children's homes that no one comments on, domestic violence work that no one comments on, the adult social care that no one else comments on. Uh, but we bring in these items because these are, the, these are genuinely the most vulnerable people in the city that we've been working with and we carry those values across all the work uh, that we do. Um, Look, we, you know, we've had a lot. We'll, we'll, we've got your statements. We will make sure that uh, people are reaching out if you feel they've, they've not reached out um, in the coming days. Um, let me just offer the floor to any other cabinet members who may or may not wish to, to comment on this item. No? Okay. Sorry, Stephen. So I've just been assured, by, you know, by Stephen as well, and, and I will check on this. The team will be down at the Harbour Forum, uh, in, you know, in February. Uh, but we have the submissions today as well that will make sure uh, people are, are responding to, dealing with any questions, any statements, uh, and, and uh, you know, taking your vision into account. Before I make this decision, I see a hand up. Sir, I'm going to give you 30 seconds because we're over. Okay. Sorry, it was the gentleman with the baseball cap. Oh, it's for you. Okay. Can I, because of a time, can I just give you 30 seconds just to get it out? Okay. Yeah, we can follow up afterwards. That's not a problem. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, lots of said. Can't address all the points about where I'm visible, who I'm meeting. I mean, it's, it's a big city, but uh, look. So, in terms of the decisions to be made today, I approve the recommendations sat in the report. We will make an ongoing commitment to, uh, to engage and to make sure that we're taking concerns into account. 
But at no point can we pretend that the financial challenge and the challenge of the harbour in Bristol is not a real one and not upon us. And no point can we t uh, pretend that we do not have to come up with a solution or we can find uh, an impact-free way of realising that solution. So thank you for your contributions. Okay, so agenda item 22, which is the combined e-scooter and e-bike on-street rental scheme. And Don, this is with you. Thank you very much, Marvin. In October 2020, Bristol started our e-scooter trial, and it's fair to say it's had a lot of interest and some considerable success. 7.3 million rides, totaling 19 million kilometres since the trial started, show that people have taken the opportunity to try out this low-carbon, congestion-reducing mode of transportation. It has always been important to us that this is an accessible addition to our transport network, so I was pleased that the trial area was expanded and is now expanded to cover the whole of the city. The government has already extended the trial period several times, which we've discussed here at Cabinet, and they've finally announced plans to legalise e-scooters and introduce powers to regulate e-scooter and bike rental schemes. The trials are therefore extended to at least May 2024, when the new powers are expected to come into force. This paper updates Cabinet on the scheme and looks forward to the next phase as the trial becomes permanent and we work through WECA to use new powers and lessons learned to improve it further. We'd like to thank VOI for their work through the trial period. As the paper explains, there is an opportunity in the next contract to consider an e-bike addition to the scheme. We'll also be able to look at some other options for on-street parking, and that will obviously help to tidy up some of the challenges that we have faced, and we know that we have faced during the trial period. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don. Um, so we've received one public forum statement and five questions on this item. The statement's from Councillor Tom Hathaway, who is not here. Um, let's let, look at the public forum statements. Uh, Rob Breyer. Okay, not here. Um, Marley Bennett. Marley. Thank you, Marvin. Um, this looks like a really exciting proposal, I think. Um, there's some real benefits. The VOI um, trial has clearly gone very well. But the fail, failure of the big issue e-bike trial and the, um, the one that preceded it, I suppose, acts as a cautionary tale. Um, so it would be really interesting to see if we can combine it into a single trial, because I, you know, I hope that works. Um, my, f my first um, question would be, and I, I suppose there's not much you can say whilst the tender process is it's ongoing, but do we have any estimations as to how much revenue we think this scheme will generate? And secondly, can we use that to support things like active travel provision? Don. Thank you. Uh, we haven't yet got an estimate of how much money uh, that we would make out of this. It, it would be a matter of setting fees, obviously, for uh, any parking spaces that were used by the company that took over, and also making sure that there's proper provision of money for officers to manage the scheme, because we know that during the trial period it hasn't been... Um, you know, it's been a bit clunky at times, let's put it like that. Uh, regarding big issue, uh, we we do have what we call a shared mobility position statement, which describes, in sort of high level terms, what 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 our vision for shared mobility, micro mobility, whatever you want to call it, is. And I think big issue felt a little bit outside of that, but th that was their choice. Um, the scheme that they they partnered with. Um, and I think this, we're on a trajectory and we're moving now towards something where these new forms of technology will become um, established and welcomed for their contribution that they make to reducing congestion and carbon emissions, but also we know how better to manage some of the challenges. And um, particularly look forward to having e-bikes involved 
because I think uh, different people like using bikes. They're perhaps more comfortable on longer journeys as an e-scooter user. Kind of got to admit that, I think, really. After a couple of miles, it gets a bit rough on the knees. Uh, and it's just, you know, anything we can do, really, to to offer people an alternative to cars um, and to get them out in the fresh air and reduce our congestion, reduce our carbon emissions, we will do and hopefully will become a more orderly, more sustainable uh, micromobility shared transport offer to the city in the future. Did I answer your question or did I over answer it? I'm sorry, it's a, bit, it's a favourite subject of mine. You, you answered it and then said, but no, thank you. Can okay. I Did ask? you have a supplementary, Marvin? Yeah, please, Marvin, thank you. And th thank you, Dom, for that answer. I, I definitely agree with what you said about it's important having that choice of e-bike or e-scooter provision. I personally prefer cycling, but, you know, appreciate that's not for everyone. I think as a principle, we're doing the right thing in saying that these ve are vehicles and should be parked on, on the road rather than sort of encroaching on the pavement. And, you know, I'm sure that will be uh, welcomed by um, walking organisations. Um, the question I'd have on that, I know there's, there's the potential for issue if you get too many scooters in a particular area, and I know Roy tries to limit the number of um, scooters that can be parked in a certain area so you don't sort of get them completely um, overtaking the pavement. Is that something we're looking to sort of carry forward as part of the new scheme to make sure that the parking is done well and managed and doesn't end up encroaching onto you know, the road or pavements or whatever? Yeah, but that's um, exactly it. But, I mean, different parts of the city are different. Out in Avonmouth, we've got places where you've got absolutely enormous pavements and roads with trucks going backwards and forwards like that where you wouldn't want to park them on the road. They're fine on the pavements. Um, it's much safer and there's plenty of space for them. Totally recognise there are places down in the centre of the city where that's not the case. And there are also places where it's been impossible up to now to park them. And we can actually uh, give over a car parking space for the parking of e-scooters. And they will have a local offer as opposed to having to walk further. So this opens up possibilities, but it's not prescriptive in terms of all e-scooters, all e-bikes will have to be parked on the road in parking spaces because that would put them um, on key routes, uh, cycleways, all kinds of places we didn't necessarily want them. We are looking at Marley. I actually visited the Voy warehouse, which is up near you, obviously, next to Morrison's off the railway path. I think it was last week. And one of the questions I asked them was about was their internal disciplinary processes for people who use them irresponsibly, leave them lying around and, and ask them about their three, three strikes, what their rates were. They do actually have the numbers of people who've had one strike, two th strikes, and have been banned from scooter use um, altogether. We also talked about some having some hard infrastructure within which uh, they could be parked. If we take a car parking space away, we have to look at revenue impact. I'm not saying, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but it is revenue. But we did ask them about the hard infrastructure. So we are on that journey to uh, uh, you look at that as well. Because get a massive benefit. The benefit comes with some challenges. Can we get rid of the challenges, which are scooters left around lying on the road and people not, not working with them properly? Broader approach, by the way, is about how we change change the legislative framework around all scooter use, which is underway as well, and then with the private scooters as well. But thank you for your question and supplementary. Yep. Um, two, councillor, two questions from Councillor Emma Edwards, but I don't think she's here. No, just to make sure. Okay. Any cabinet members wish to comment? Can I just check who actually uses the scooters? Just a moment of clarity. <laughs> 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 So is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Okay, so it's just Helen and Asher. <laughs> okay, all right, Don. Let me hand back to you now to take the decision, which I support and will now be displayed on the screen. Thank you. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Don and Craig. You're on your way out again. OK. Agenda item 23, Cultural Investment Programme, Openness and Imagination Funding. And I'm going to introduce this report because uh, I'm bringing it to Cabinet, this paper to Cabinet, which 
seeks to provide an update on the cultural investment program. We have paused the current application process to allow a review of the agreed process to take place. And while this happens, the paper seeks to roll over and maintain the existing levels of investment for the Openness Fund and so provides Bristol-based arts and culture organisations some certainty while the authorised process is reaffirmed. It's that straightforward. So we've had no public forum statements or questions. Any cabinet members wish to comment on this item? Okay. I'm just going to turn and make the decision. So there's no comment on this. In terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Can you let Craig, someone let Craig know he's free to come back in. Item 24, energy efficiency measures for homes. Kai, you're bringing this item. Thanks, Marvin. Um, I, won't, I won't take too long on this report. It's, it's quite a straightforward one. Um, and it's um, a bit of good news as well. What we're seeking to do here is to... Um, seek permission to accept um, grant funding that we've already that we've applied for but also to seek permission to apply for further further funding under the homes upgrade grant scheme up until 2025 um, we're part of a partnership bid with the current live bid with our uh, neighboring authorities um, uh, so it's north somerset and bath and northeast somerset so not not south gloss with this one but it's overall, it's worth 11.3 million. The amount of money that could be coming to Bristol is three million pounds, and it's um, the schemes targeted on um, owner occupiers and private renters that live in a property that's um, got a rating of an EPC D or worse, and have a household income less than 31,000 pounds a year. So it's quite targeted on um, low-income households in that in that in that situation. Um, the other thing to note with this one is that it is intended for the work to be carried out by Amoresco as part of the City Leap partnership. So this is this will be one of the first um, uh, pieces of work that gets done by the partnership. If obviously we get all the good news with the if, if the bids are successful or not, which I'm told uh, is highly likely. Thanks, Guy. And it, 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 again, it adds to the list of interventions, initiatives and, and drives, we are leading on to decarbonise you know, our cities and our, our city systems. Don't always see the light of day in terms of public storytelling, but nonetheless, our, we just do the business. Uh, anyway, um, we've received a public forum statement from Councillor Fodor, who's not here. Um, there were no public forum questions. Can I ask any cabinet members if you'd wish to comment on this item? Just uh, one of the, the, the big challenges we're taking on. Kai, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. OK, Craig, we're to you now. Agenda item 25, estate rationalisation, surplus asset disposals. Yeah, thanks, Marvin, and I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, the BCC property strategy was adopted in March 2020 and sets out the objectives for the property portfolio and the ambi ambition to deliver those objectives by implementation of a new corporate landlord framework and a comprehensive review of the portfolio. This work is ongoing, but in the meantime, the financial pressure on the Council and the resulting need to deliver significant capital receipts and revenue savings from the portfolio mean that work to identify assets no longer required for service delivery is prioritised and accelerated. Cabinet approved the open market disposal of five surplus assets in July this year, and this report and appendix identifies a further six operational assets, which are either vacant or underused. Prior to disposal on the open market, there will be reviews to assess suitability for use by housing as temporary accommodation, housing development, or for sale to registered providers. Any staff still in the buildings will, will be relocated to other suitable council accommodation. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, we've received no uh, public forum statements or questions. Um, can I ask any cabinet members if they wish to comment? Tom. Just briefly, um, welcome the opportunity is um, creating for us to look at housing on some of these sites where it's where the suitable, which is obviously not all going to be. So, you know, looking forward to continuing to working with yourself and the property team uh, on that. Thanks very much, Tom. Well, Craig, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and will now be displayed on the screen. Thanks, Marvin. In terms of the decisions to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Uh, Craig, we're staying with you. Uh, print services, digital and litho procurement. 
that's the one that the crowd was in for. Um, this, re this report is for the procurement for bespoke print suppliers. Currently, the council has a framework of suppliers to fulfil requirements, including the production of leaflets, surveys and forms. The existing framework currently has six suppliers who are asked to quote on every requirement in a mini competition process to ensure value for money. During future procurement, bidders will be assessed against all mandatory pricing and quality measures, including social value and sustainability. Today, we are seeking approval to procure a new framework of suppliers for bespoke print services for a maximum of four years at a cost of up to 1.5 million. All right, so uh, we've had no public forum or statements on this. Uh, Asha, you were particularly animated on this item, I think. <laughs> the printers. No, I'm being, I'm, I'm joking with you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm assuming no cabinet members have a comment. Okay, uh, Craig, let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and will now be displayed on the screen. In terms of the decisions we made today, I approve the recommendations I set out in the report. Okay, Ellie, we're to you now. Um, agenda item 27, meals, services and supplies. Thank you. Relatively straightforward one as well. It's got two elements to it. Uh, primarily, it is to gain permission to procure a supply contract for the Council's catering supplies and secondly, to instruct the service to develop a business case regarding our parks and green spaces concessions. Our existing food supply contract was procured in 2018 and was awarded for four years, which was then extended to May 2023. Cafes and kiosks in parks and green spaces, Bristol schools and community meal services, residential and day services are directly provided by adult social care, all use the contract and need a new one in order to continue their services. The dynamic purchasing system has no contractual, no obligation to spend and therefore it will allow us to move to a more corporate contract at any time. Separately, we are undertaking a review of our various catering contracts with an aim to take a strategic view of the current contracts to identify the greatest opportunity for savings and value for money through a corporate contract. Therefore, we'd like to be presented with an outline business case for the review of operating models for parks, food and beverage and catering outlets, including alternative delivery models. Oh, my computer's gone down. Uh, to, I think to come back to us in, in the May Cabinet. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. No public forum statements or questions. ITV start again. Is that a third time today? Yeah, uh, don't worry. It happened in the middle of my Zoom with the Foreign Commonwealth Office the other day. Um, Ellie, Cabinet wish to comment? Oh, OK. So I'm going to hand back to you now, Ellie. Oh, Helen, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say yet again about how wonderful our community meals service is. And you've visited, many of us have, have visited and it's important obviously to get the supply end of that right but it's also about the operational and provision end of it but it's a lifesaver for so many people thank thank you Helen um, Ellie let me hand back to you now to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen thank you in terms of the decision to be made today I approve the recommendations as set out in the report Agenda item 28, financial update report, Craig. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marvin. Um, this is obviously an important one after laughing at the last one. Um, the, the finance report for period eight, quarter three, constitutes a full detailed report on the Council's latest forecast revenue and capital position for the full year of 22-23 and comes to Cabinet alongside the budget report for 23-24. A quarter three, the council is forecasting, forecasting a risk-adjusted overspend of 9.5 million, which represents 2.2% of the council's general fund budget. This is a 2.7 million improvement when compared to the 12.2 million forecast of period seven. However, it does include a deterioration in children and family service, plus um, a bit in um, education skills and home school transport. Supplementary estimates will be presented to full council as part of the budget 23-24 report in the case that these are required to meet full year spending requirements. The Council's general fund continues to include a £2.2 million for additional inflation risks. The housing revenue account is forecasting an uh, £8 million pound full year overspend. This represents a £6 million deterioration since period 7, reflecting Cabinet's approval of the urgent provision of interim fire safety measures at Council's HRA high-rise blocks. If this forecast overspend materialises, it will be funded from the HRA general reserves. The dedicated school grant is forecasting an £18.8 million full year overspend. This represents a £1.1 million improvement since period 7. This overspend will bring the DSG's carried forward deficit at the close of 22-23 to 43.5 million. Public Health continues to report no variance to its ring fence annual budget of 34.6. The capital programme forecast variance at quarter three is a net 27.8 million underspend on its general fund activities, including corporate contingency and a 3.7 million underspend on the HRA's capital programme. Cabinet is asked to approve the reprofiling of the forecast net 21.7 million capital general fund over underspend from 2022 into 23 into future periods. 
Thank you, Craig. Uh, no public forum statements or questions. Uh, any cabinet members wish to comment? Just thank you for your leadership, Craig, and the officers for the work, as we, we said at the front end. Let me hand back to you now, Craig, to take the decision which I support and which will now be displayed on the screen. Thanks, Marvin. Um, in terms of the decision to be made today, I approve the recommendations as set out in the report. Okay, agenda item 29, Corporate Risk Management Report, Q3 22 at 23. Craig? Last paper, and it is just for noting, so I will be very quick. The, corpus risk, the Corporate Risk Management Report for Quarter 3 is a key document capturing the Council's approach to the management of risk. It captures strategic risks set out in the Corporate Strategy 2018 to 2023. It further seeks to provide assurance that the Council's main risks have been identified and appropriate mitigations are in place to ensure they are managed within agreed time of tolerances. This includes, as set out in the Budget and Treasury report passed earlier this afternoon, measures to ensure appropriate financial provision for these risks as it made it through the budget planning process. I'm hoping that um, Cabinet are aware of the risks within their own areas, and I just recommend it for noting. Thank you, Craig. Um, any Cabinet member comment? No public forum statements or questions? Any Cabinet comment? Okay, so Cabinet notes the report. Okay, thank you uh, for that for today. That's the end of today's Cabinet meeting. Thank you for everyone who attended, uh, and the many who watched on, online. Uh, the date of the next Cabinet meeting is February the 7th, 2023 at 4pm. I'll see you then.